grow for the next 20 years. What makes the city a great place to have a business is that it's a great place to live. The lower cost of living, fantastic schools, central location and beautiful nature make Duncanville a uniquely special place in DFW. I opened Romas in Duncanville October 26, 2011. The support from the community here in Duncanville has allowed us to grow throughout the years tremendously. I'm happy to see the city of Duncanville follow through on their commitment to bringing new businesses and supporting the current businesses. DFW is growing incredibly fast and we're right in the middle of it all. We are where opportunity meets history, where hometown meets urban access. Duncanville is more than just a city. We are a destination. Hi, this is Officer Luna with the Duncanville Traffic Unit. Just letting you know that tomorrow, August 10th, Duncanville ISD starts school back. Let you know with the school's lights are flashing, if you do receive a citation, the fines can double. Just remember while you're in the school zone, pay attention to all the kids that are walking and also to put your cell phones down. Hi, my name is Lauren Sanchez, Regional Emergency Manager for the cities of Cedar Hill, Duncanville, DeSoto, and Lancaster. Fire Prevention Week is celebrated from October 8th through October 14th, and the Duncanville Fire Department would like to remind all residents that fire prevention and fire safety start with you. Always pay attention to fire prevention. Did you know that kitchen fires are the leading cause of home fires and home fire injuries? That's why it's important for all residents to understand that fire prevention and cooking safety is extremely important. Today we're going to talk about the recipe of home fire safety to keep you safe in your home. Unattended cooking is the leading cause of home fires and deaths. Always stand by your pan. If you leave the kitchen, turn off the burner. Remember to always turn pot handles away from the front of the stove towards the back so that they cannot accidentally be bumped over or pulled over the front of the stove. Always have a lid and oven mitt near your pan when cooking so that if a small grease fire starts, you can take the lid, slide it over the pan, and turn off the burner. When grilling, always make sure that your grill is in an open space and not near anything that can catch fire, like the side of your house, decking, rails, or even tree branches. Also, never leave a grill unattended when it is in use. Clubbing and cooking don't mix. After a night out, order in. For more general information on cooking safety and fire prevention week, visit www.fpw.org. And for more information for kids, and cooking safety, visit sparky.org. Hello champions, I'm Officer Michelle Arias, the Crime Prevention Officer for the Duncanville Police Department. Today I'm here to let you know what each permitted solicitor must wear if they're coming to your door. We have recently received several reports of suspicious people impersonating city or utility company employees. As a reminder, each permitted solicitor should be wearing a reflective vest like this. The vest should display a pictured ID on the front side and a permit number on the back side. As always, if you see a suspicious person or suspicious activity, call 911 and report it immediately. My name is Talia Lopez. I'm the Crime Victim Advocate for Duncanville Police Department. Crime Victim Advocate, what we do is that we help and support um, victims of violent crimes with education, um, information, um, and further resources. 
I work with a lot of domestic violence victims and their families. I provide support as well as resources. That includes the women's shelter, um, Genesis Women's Shelter, um, the family place, that's shelter for men, women, and children. Um, counseling support, because that's really important. Um, trauma support services of North Texas, um, as well as the victim intervention pro program um, by Parkland. They provide those services, as well as immigration. Um, I do assist with the U visa process, um, as well as.
Good evening, everyone. The time is six o'clock, and welcome to our city council briefing session for April the 2nd of 2024. And I believe it's April. What happened to Christmas? Time is flying so fast. So we welcome everyone here tonight. We have a, a pretty full agenda for briefings and a pretty reasonable schedule for what we need to accomplish tonight. Uh, just for a little bit of housekeeping. Oh, I need to mention uh, that we are recording and streaming at this moment. So this is what we always do. I wanted to make sure our tech, tech is online. We're good to go. Okay. I just want to make sure of that. Okay. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. We have several people here for uh, Mr. John Wally Price's office. He is has a presentation. He's item number 3C on our agenda. If he arrives early or if he arrives, whenever he arrives, we're going to go for that presentation. Okay. And if not, we'll just work the presentation again as we have it. So right now he is third, and we'll see how it works. But we want to give him respect and deference to go as soon as he gets in. Okay? Very good. All right, moving on. Uh, Mr. City Manager, the consent agenda items, please. Uh, yes, Mayor. So first is the minutes. So skipping right on to 4B, considering uh, ordinance of the City of Duncanville amending Ordinance 2502. Section 3, annual pay scale for classified positions under civil service and police and fire, providing pay scale under civil service for dealing with ordinances in conflict herewith. At our last uh, meeting, we had a briefing on this by HR Director Siegel, and he is here to help answer any questions along with police and fire. If we could take a moment on that, I, I did print off the scales themselves. Okay. Uh, Mr. Siegel, just, I highlighted where you have them in red so that we know exactly what we're looking at. Uh, it's understandable to me, it's understandable the narration as well, and what we have. So, I get it. Does anyone have, this is, a, this is a pretty important item. So, does any council member have any questions or some information they need from Mr. Siegel before we go forward with this one? No. Very good. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Okay, great. Thank Very you. good. Thank you. And uh, for our police and fire, it's a good move. It's good to move for our first department. Appreciate that very much. Yes, Mr. Finch. Moving okay. On. Um, Mr. Price, Commissioner Price, you come in the house. How are you, sir? Very good. Your folks are right here. No. I'm man downtown. Oh. Mr. Price, good to have you. Thank you. What we wanted to do, in respect for you, mm -hmm. we want to move the agenda around, let you go as soon as possible so that you're here. Okay. So with that, we're going to go ahead and move to your present. Alberta, great to see you. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Thanks to see you all. So with that, uh, everyone understanding that we're very happy to move up to Smith Thank Price, you. Mr. John Wadi Price, to our meeting today. We do have it on the agenda for an item that he's going to give a presentation on. So, sir, we're turning it over to you and your crew. Okay. 
Mr. Mayor, member of the council and staff, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Dallas County made this investment uh, some time ago with regards to the whole floodplain study. And what we've done is, is that as we continue to have these hearings and doing the mapping, one of the things we want to do is inform all of the councils as to where we are in this process. Uh, Dallas County made the investment because we knew that it was an imperative. There are a lot of our cities that have not done the mapping in, in, in probably several decades. And it's just an imperative that this particular presentation be here tonight. And uh, Mr. Shepard, who is our Director of Floodplain Management, is here, of course, uh, uh, Tashara and, and Albert, who is our Director of Public Works. We're all here, and of course, our vendor uh, is here as well, APM. And so tonight, we will inform the council as to where we are with this process as we continue to go to the Texas Water Development Board and get projects in Dallas County. Um, as I said this morning in court, uh, we still don't really understand the impact of, of flood, flood planning. And uh, one of the things that uh, this particular process has done to all of the council, and especially with 10 Mile Creek, uh, y'all have some challenges here in Duncan Bill, and uh, we're gonna be able to try to help you navigate that as one of our projects. So with that, Lisa Shepard, like I said, is head of not only bridge management, but is head of floodplain, and I wanted to come by and so support them, Mr. Mayor. Okay, great, Commissioner, thank you very much. And we're here tonight to talk with you about our Dallas County Import <coughs> Flood Planning Study that we've been working on for about two years now. And um, this is the agenda that I'll go through tonight. I'm just going to kind of spotlight some things. Um, but I'm going to talk about the inland port for a little bit and who our stakeholders are and what the purpose of the study. And then I'm going to turn it over to Ron, and he's going to Ron back there with APM. And he's going to talk about the scope and the schedule, and then I'm going to come back and talk about next steps of the flood infrastructure fund. And also, I do also want to introduce Jared Overby, but Ron will talk a, a little bit more about him later, about Jared's involvement in the study. So the Inland Port area. Well, let's talk a little bit about what the Inland Port area is. It's about 120 square miles or 78,000 acres. It includes the intermodal facility. Um, one thing about the Inland Port is that there's um, so many interstate highways in the area, and that's what really makes it a port, is having the intermodal facility plus all the highways and the transportation um, for logistics and freight. Um, and again, at this shape of the Inland Port, it's not really a formal um, boundary, but that's how we've defined it in our flood study, and it was defined that way um, in the SDCIA study that was done in 2012 and then updated in 2021. And it stands for the South Dallas Infrastructure Analysis. And um, COG did the study in 2012, and then Dallas County updated it in 2021. Um, and this area also has the Inland Port Transportation Management Association where um, employees can get uh, discounted rides within this, this area. So um, just want to point that out as well. So this slide shows the growth. And this aerial photo was taken in 2005, right around the time that the intermodal facility came on board. And so you can see the tremendous growth that we've seen since that time um, because of, of the facility. Lots of warehouses in the area. These are some businesses in the Inland Port area. We have about 82 businesses here in this area that we heard about last week. Um, some of them you've certainly heard of, like Amazon or um, FedEx. There's also Kroger. Um, there's a new, new company called Trina Solar that uh, manufactures solar panels. So 
there's um, another company called Biagi that's right next to the rail that um, distributes beer throughout the Metroplex. This slide right here is shows our flood risk in the area. And this is really why we're doing this project because you have um, Ten Mile Creek and then the Trinity River coming in. And so um, this slide highlights the inland port area, but also shows the area that we're going to talk about a little bit more later called the Huck 10 area that's shown in red. And that includes Duncanville. So we were able to. Expand our study a little bit to be able to obtain uh, funding from the state of Texas, uh, from the Texas Water Development Board, and we were able to add our, our Hubson area, which included um, Duncanville, Cedarville, C Cedar Hill, and DeSoto to the west, and then to the east, um, Segoville Combine, and Mesquite, and Box Springs. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the study. These are our stakeholders, like I said. Um, I talked about the Huck 10 area and then the Inland Port area. We also have three counties involved in, in this study, um, Kaufman and Ellis County as well as Dallas County. And every other uh, month we have a task force meeting. And so Jackie from Duncanville, your Director of Public Works, uh, comes and meets with us on um, Thursday, the first Thursday of the month, I believe. And then we also invite these other stakeholders too, because we consider them to be our partners in floodplain management. So we have um, people from the Texas Water Development Board that attend, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, that we honored today at our commissioner's court, and then uh, TxDOT and the TRA. So why is this project important? Well, the purpose of our flood study is to minimize the loss of life, the loss of property. We want to determine an approach to minimize flooding, and we want to submit projects to the state for funding. So that's, that's really the key reason here, is that we want to identify curated and qualified projects for inclusion in the Texas state flood plan. And then on August 22nd of 2022, we tested a lot of these systems because we had the second most rainfall event in 24 hours. And so you might recall that and your city has probably been impacted by that event. And Jared is going to show some, some areas later in this presentation where we have those. So again, this is our... Um, Huck 10 area that I talked about shown in blue, and it increased our study area to 230 square miles, and it also includes the inland port. So this is really um, in this presentation to just bring extra awareness to the fact that we are uh, doing models. Um, Commissioner Price had mentioned that the 10 Mile Creek had not been studied since the late 70s, and um, APM and the rest of the team, Jared with Half Associates, is studying 10 Mile Creek, and we, can, we are updating those models, and we're determining where the flood risk is and identifying projects where structures and um, roads can be lifted out of the floodplain or flood risk areas. So um, there's some terminology that you're going to hear us talk about, and um, we're going to talk about FME, FMPs, flood risk, and floodplain. But FME is a flood mitigation evaluation. Um, FMP is a flood mitigation project. And so that's just lingo that the um, Texas Water Development Board likes to use. And then Ron's going to talk more about what freeboard is. That's the difference between the water surface elevation and the bottom of a bridge or, or another structure. So this is our consulted team. And this is actually where Ron usually comes in, right? <laughs> You've probably been given this presentation 10 times, different variations of it as we get further along. But 
So uh, I want to repeat, we are happy to be here tonight, and we do appreciate the opportunity to discuss this important study that's not only important for all of the stakeholders, but also for the county and for the state as we're trying to find projects that can be built in the future. Um, like you said, I'm Ron O'Connell. I'm with APM and Associates, and I am the project manager for the consulting team. Uh, we've teamed with what I would consider to be uh, some of, if not the best, hydraulics firms in the Metroplex. And Jared Overby is with HALF, and uh, HALF is responsible for the scope of work associated with Ten Mile Creek, and I'll let him talk about specifically what he's looking at in Duncanville as we go forward. All right, so what are we doing? So in the Hub 10 area, it's really a hydraulic study looking at the creek. So initially, we were looking at Ten Mile and Trinity River. We discovered as we were gathering all the models up from everywhere, all the different places, that a new effective model for the Trinity River is fixed to be put out. So that we didn't really need, not just for this part, but for the all of Trinity River. So we weren't really needing to remodel that. Um, Ten Mile did need to be modeled. So what we did is we modified our scope with the county, and the county modified their agreement with the Texas Water Development Board. If you go back to these, you can see the red ones in the inland port were missing. That's Cottonwood Creek and Rollins Creek. And so we modified the scope to... Point out the inland port. The inland port is actually the purple. It goes straight up 35. Does this thing have a little point? So right here, and then it so, goes across Loop 12, and yep. then it comes down the Trinity okay. to the bottom at the, and then comes straight across. We got a little piece of Ferris in there, but it's like 35, the Trinity River, Loop 12, and then the County Drive kind of defines the end of the Uh huh. So in that, we're we're looking at those major creeks, and then in the Inland Port proper, in addition to the creeks, we're also looking at the stormwater piping. So all the pipe, the major trunk lines, 24 inches and larger, not the little stuff, but more the big stuff. And what we're doing is we're doing, it should say, the new word is flood risk. So we're mapping the flood risk, what it is now, we're updating all the models, and then what would it look like if we did these improvements? In addition to that, we've reviewed all the design criteria for all of the stakeholders in both the Inland Port and the Hub 10. And at the end, we're supposed to recommend what makes the best sense going forward to analyze all of these systems. And then, of course, the big deal is to find projects. Okay. Where are we at right now? All of the existing models for all the new stuff and all the existing creeks is all done. We're kind of been what I, what I call the critical needs assessment. So what we're doing now is we're starting to look at projects, look at the ones that are going to score well for the state, and then start evaluating those, put those in the model and see what happens. Um, we're developing a planning level set of plans for those improvements because we're going to do a pretty serious probable construction cost because as part of the stuff that we have to do for the state, we have to do a cost benefit analysis. So we have to make sure that the projects are worth doing too. All right, so here, here is a floodplain uh, map actually, one of the ones that we're doing, this is in Hutchins. And so the big, so effective, which is the current one, and then what does it look like with the improvements? The big thing with uh, the state to be able to score well and be able to get on the list, to have the opportunity to apply for a grant, is this is what the state's looking for. How much land are you taking out of the flood risk? How many structures, critical facilities, police stations, schools, hospitals? And then how much road can you get there so people can get back and forth when it's flooding? The big challenge for this team versus a normal project is that the state is requiring this no impact. And so to do that, there's no, we gotta watch the velocities, we gotta watch our valley storage, and we gotta watch our water surface elevations. This is a prime example. This was his first pass at this. And just to do the uh, storage area, that's like 80 acre feet. Well, they're selling that, that land up there at $5 a square foot. It doesn't work too good. So we've gone back and revised that. But those are the issues and the challenges that these te this team is coming up with as it moves forward. All the information is up on a Project SharePoint site. Everybody on the team has access to it. It's, the consultants have a folder, the stakeholders, and then in the project information, these are all the subfolders, all the GIS, all the models, all the evaluations, everything's up there and everybody has access to this. So how are we approaching this? How are we tackling this job? We're looking at it 
the study, we're looking at it by basins, drainage basins. So on the north, we're looking at the five mile basin. On the south is the 10 mile basin. And then we have the Cottonwood Creek Basin, which includes the little creeks in, so it's really the Wilmer Hutchins Basin. Talk about the five mile, um, it's 17 miles long. It drains 60.8 square miles of watershed and there's almost six square miles of that at flood risk. So how are we doing it? So you heard Lisa talk about the SDCIA. Now they looked at everything. They looked at the roads, they looked at water lines and sewer lines for what needed to be improved, but they looked at storm sewer. So we started there. And in addition to that, we looked at these areas that we thought may score well with the state. So given that, we started with 16 as our uh, preliminary projects to look at. So the first cut, and you heard Lisa talk about freeboard, is what are overtopped or threatened? Which ones don't meet the freeboard? And that's the picture there. In our 100-year storm, the water surface elevation has to be two foot below the bottom of that bridge. Based off of that, it drops down to these seven. So I want to talk about Alta Mesa this corner right here, and Tracy Road and Stuart Simpson. This is kind of one of our uh, good projects that we came up with. So here at Tracy Road, we're putting in a new 60-foot bridge, and we're putting a new box culvert down at Simpson. It takes out 26 acres of land out of flood. It takes 1,650 road, foot of road out, and six structures, one of them critical. This project, we're pretty proud of this because we, we've been working with uh, Inland Forge stakeholders monthly. And because of what's going on here, and Dallas is actually doing something to the drainage divide adjacent to this one. So to try to get all that coordinated together, they've actually added this as a project on their needs list. So Dallas is looking to do this project already. 10 Mile Creek, uh, at this point, I'm gonna let uh, Mr. Jared come up and talk about his work. Thank you, Ron. Um, as Ron mentioned, 10 Mile Creek hadn't been studied in its entirety since late 70s. Uh, Duncanville, a little bit more proactive than that. You guys did a floodplain management plan, I think, in 1986-ish. And so uh, that was just for the small portion of 10 Mile through Duncanville and some of its tributaries as well. But for this study, we're looking at the 28.5 miles for all the way from the headwaters down to its confluence with the Trinity River. It's got 78 square miles of watershed, 49 tributaries, but we're not looking at all 49. We're looking at the main stem only and then some other tributaries in DeSoto as well. Six square miles of flood risk, 32 bridge crossings, and two culvert crossings right here in Duncanville. Um, so we've got our, we've finished our preliminary run of this. We've got our existing conditions, hydrology and hydraulics, without any improvements to the stream. Um, so we've got updated floodplain maps and flood risk. For, well, we're staying away from floodplain because these are not regulatory maps. These aren't going to FEMA. We've done everything with ultimate conditions. So we're saying this is built out watershed. This is what the, the maximum flood risk could be. Um, so we've now looked at all of those. We've looked at areas that we think that we can actually do something with, some improvements that we could match that criteria, that really strict criteria that Ron was talking about. The no downstream impacts, the no upstream impacts, no water surface elevation impacts, no velocity impacts. And that really puts us in a box of what we can do. Because if you look at this, if you looked at that image that Lissa showed, this area is developing like crazy. Duncanville is pretty much developed out. You've got some land along the floodplain, but that's conserved land. So we can't use that. We're not going to be benching that out. You guys want to use that for parks and trails mm -hmm. and, um, and for other amenities. So we're looking at what can we do. So in Duncanville, we're kind of hemmed in with that, but we did find one area up here with two culvert crossings that we think that we can do something with. And it's not really gonna help flood risk reduction to homes, but we have two overtop roads. And we've got one at Beaver Creek Drive here in Briar Hill Circle. And we're looking at what we consider the 100 year flood risk, right? That's that, um, that 1% chance of, of this flooding. In August 2022, you guys got something around a, between a 500 and 1,000 year event. So just for the 100 year event, which is the criteria that we're following for this, each of these roads are overtopped by about a foot. Now you can see the floodplain's pretty narrow through there. But we've got all of this neighborhood right here highlighted. 
and because these two roads are the only access to that neighborhood. So if you get a major storm event, something like August 2022, emergency services cannot help this area. You know, any crime that happens, somebody has a heart attack, these roads would be impassable or be dangerous for emergency vehicles to get to. So we thought that that was really important. It kind of doesn't fit within um, the overall goal of what Texas Water Development Board is doing, which is reducing flood risk to homes, properties. But it does help in a sense that it does relieve some hazard to these people during a major event. So we're looking at that. We think that that's going to be a pretty, uh, pretty good project um, because it's 92 structures, 92 homes there, and um, actually 703 feet of road that's flooded. So that's quite a bit. Now I'll turn it back over to Ron. So one of the things we're finding is <clears throat> you heard us talking about we're updating these models, right? So we're using we've done some survey at some of the crossings. We're using an updated lidar survey of the land. Well, here's a project. Here's a, a creek. It's up at the northern end of Lancaster, and just by updating the model, because the hash lines are the current. It's called effective. The current model. The light blue is the updated model where we've gone in and used the new new survey, and then the orange is what's left if we do improvements. But not doing anything here at all, we would take all of these homes off of the firm map and not have to get flood insurance just by updating the models. Conway Creek, the Wilmer Hutchins one, um, these are the four major creeks. There's some 484s and 481s that, that tie into all this, but these are the four major creeks that define that basin. Um, one of the things that we did as part of our scope and requirement was we validated our models by we did flow data. So we actually put flow meters out on those three creeks, Cottonwood, Ten Mile, and Hutchins, I mean Rollins, the three ones that we're doing transit models on. And then in that one of the big storms at Ten Mile, that little picture in the corner, that uh, flow meter got hit by that debris, and that young man found it about two miles downstream. So where are we at on our schedule? I've kind of, uh, like I said, we've done this a couple of times. I just kind of grayed out the stuff. I felt silly saying that we did our first public meeting two years ago. We've done that. All of our data, we pretty much got all our data. Our survey, except for some of the stuff in the Elam Port modeling, we're in critical needs. You've seen the, you've seen the graphics today. We're looking for projects. Our preliminary study is due to the county and state in this fall, October. We'll do our third and final public meeting in the winter. And then the final study is due at the first part of next year. And with that, I'll get out of the way. Okay, I'm back. So what's next? Well, we're gonna continue to work with our stakeholders and develop drainage evaluations for priority projects like Ron stated. And um, they're really working on uh, identifying those projects that are good curated projects, as I like to say, and develop those cost-benefit ratios that meet this Texas Water Development Board's criteria. Um, we do have a website for our project, um, and we also have public meetings, so we certainly would invite you to um, come to those public meetings when we have them. The, the next one we'll have will be in the in the winter is, is what we have identified. And then I just want to talk a little bit about um, the Flood Infrastructure Fund. Um, back in 2019, the Flood Infrastructure Fund was conceived. It was kind of an answer to, um, you know, in Texas, if you've lived here for a long time, back in 2010 to about 2014, we were in a drought. You might remember water restrictions. And then in 2015, we started seeing a lot of floods. Same with 2016. And then in 2017, we had Hurricane Harvey. And so the next time the legislature met, they um, assigned the Texas Water Development Board the Flood Infrastructure Fund. And um, they shifted funding from the Rainy Day Fund to the Flood Infrastructure Fund. And so you might remember going to the ballot box in November of 2019 and voting for, I believe it was Proposition 8, um, to fund the Flood Infrastructure Fund. 
So um, the flood, in, with that, the state flood plan was also born, and that was um, modeled after the state water plan. And so I'm on the committee for the um, regional flood planning group, and I know Jared is with the consulting firm that puts that together. But um, that document is what identifies those projects. So, um, and then through that flood infrastructure fund is how we obtained our funding for this project. So um, just this past year, Senate Bill 30 assigned an additional 624 million to the flood infrastructure fund. This slide shows the um, regional flood planning groups, the, the 15 regions that Texas was divided into, and how we all came up with one state flood plan. And so we're in the Trinity region, which is region three. So this is the timeline for the state flood plan. And uh, we're just at the first of the year, but in September, that's that state flood plan is going to be delivered to the legislature. And in fact, on Thursday, there's a webinar uh, meeting with the Texas Water Development Board to discuss policy changes that, that we might want to want to make. So we're definitely, I'm definitely attending that meeting virtually. This is an example uh, from the regional flood plan that shows all the different parameters that Ron alluded to in his presentation that the Texas Water Development Board likes to have. So this is why this is a multi-year project because they have to find out about the population that's at risk and how many structures are they removing from flood risk. And just all those different parameters helps identify those <coughs> good projects. And on that state, um, that flood infrastructure fund where the 624 million has been allocated, 375 is gonna be available this year. Um, they had um, an invitation to apply um, that goes on until April 15th. And um, they'll be identifying projects for the 325 million that's on that slide, or 375 million. And then probably the next year, in 2026, 20, 27, or 25, 26, they'll release the remainder of those funds. So that's, that's really it for our discussion this evening. Mr. Mayor, yeah. Mr. Mayor, let me, let me just say that these dollars never were intended for to come this far in the report. This was basically about the coast. Proposition 8 was primarily about the coastal area and taking care of all of the floods and all that had happened in that area. Uh, staff was extremely astute as we began to see what we were up against in, in this particular area, and as such, uh, we went after the money. Miss um, Shepard and, of course, uh, Director. And I can't say enough about Jackie because one of the things she's done, she's attended all of the meetings, the public meetings with our other cities, uh, always being there and representing Duncanville. But they never intended for that, those dollars to come into this region. And um, the court, we were able to, I was able to convince the court that we needed to go after those dollars and to the tune of about seven million dollars which has made this this project uh, a viable and so while you may or may not see the the details that uh, Lissa and ron talk about this is just an imperative as we continue to talk about developing uh, this area last thing i want to say is is that Two courts ago, I created what was called the LGC, Local Government Corporation. And it was primarily about, you know, the inland port. And the reason is because those of us in the southern sector have got to be able to speak with one voice. There are 695 
million dollars that's available for inland ports. Top 10 cities in this country. Only two are not a buttressing, basically waterways. Dallas is number four. Atlanta is number eight. And so we have a strategic plan for this area and how we continue to talk about development. She talked about uh, Trina Solar. and I don't know if you know, they're the largest commercial manufacturer in the world. Never had left uh, Korea until this year. They're now in Wilmer, first phase, 1,500 jobs as a result of them coming in as part of the Infrastructure Act. Um, in Mesquite, uh, we now have Canadian solar, another 1,500 jobs. And so what we're beginning to see with this collaboration around what's going on in District 3 in the Southern Sector is the fact that we're beginning to speak in one voice and eligible to go after uh, those dollars that will impact this community. So I have a couple of questions. Sure. Yeah. First is to Jackie for participating and then bringing us into this. So I don't know how important it is. And my seat on the RTC represents seven cities, which includes Wilmer Hutchins and that whole stretch. So anytime I see this map with Wilmer Hutchins, Vault Springs, and all that, my mind goes to the RTC and transportation. I know the Texas Water Development Board is looking at other pieces, but so when I see this, my perspective is much larger than the city of Knockerville because I understand where it's happening. And and I made a note because in the and Ron showed the before or the before picture and the current picture with all the concrete going up on 35 and 45, it's concrete going up, the concrete going down for those are non permeable surfaces. And when I think about flooding, I mean, we've even had in our city discussions about non-permeable surfaces and how to handle water coming off of buildings and parking lots that are being built in our city and how to handle that, that runoff. And I'm thinking, is any of that down, like they're building all those warehouses and distribution centers, tons and tons of cubic feet of concrete. I know it's all going to flow downhill, but is that included in the study? So. The, the flooding that we are looking to avoid here in our city, is it going to be affecting, for what's going down in like Wilmer Hutchins, 45 and 35 and all that concrete going down, are we going to be better off with what Ron described in terms of what we're going to be seeing here for our homes coming out of the flood plain? And the other question I have may be disassociated, but anytime time you talk about water, I think about TCEQ. And any time we have a flood or a sewer overflow or something like that, because of all this rain, and we have, we're very good about a city letting TCEQ know when we have a flood. And we, we, we categorize it, we document it, we let them know. So thinking about our ability to, well, let's put it this way, our ability to not have any flooding as a result of what this is going to do, is it going to mitigate any of our sewer over flooding so we don't have these issues with TCEQ? And if that's really an outlier question, say, that's fine <laughs> for another time. But I keep thinking about, we've had, you know, Jackie, every time we have some a sewer overflow as a result of these heavy rains, it comes into play. So thinking about homes that we can take out of floodplain with these projects that Ron ex explained to us can be a real strong advantage to not just the flooding, but our, our watershed. Can we jump in? Yes. Yeah, come on. So we'll start with the first question for you. Uh, the permeable surfaces and all that kind of stuff. You actually score better on these projects if you use something green. So the whole team is looking green the whole time. Now in Wilmer and Hutchins, as they're building all that concrete, you know, both of those cities require them to do that stormwater detention. I don't know how much of y'all are doing. So that there's supposed to be no change from what it is now by storing the water and dumping it in slowly. So those two things could kind of help out. As far as the city of Duncanville, you saw on, on uh, Jared's map, right? You're looking at five or six locations downstream from here. So anything that we're gonna do downstream is gonna help upstream, right? So to alleviate the flooding as it goes down, it'll help the whole system. Am I, is that correct? You that say is that's correct? At least up to a certain point. Right, now you guys look 
some of the stuff that we're seeing, you're not getting a whole bunch of houses flooded. And then to answer your question about sewer, yeah, if we take it out of the street and the street doesn't get flooded and it's not it doesn't yeah, dump in your thing, yeah, we, we're then it should off. it should certainly help. Yes, I would think so. Right. Okay. Any other? Yeah, Jackie, do you have something you want to contribute? You look like you're ready to say something. Well, <laughs> Ron's addressed what I was going to say, Mayor. Uh, I was going to address the issue of the sanitary sewer overflows yep, and um, you know alleviating the flood. The flooding will also. Um, you know, potentially alliviate some of the um, SSOs. Yeah. 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 Thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you. I wanted to know if we have any plans to create uh, wetlands, uh, bioswales, any greenery to help alleviate some of the and that's all the, that's all the green stuff right, right. so that's our all team stuff, all our team when they're looking at stuff and i they haven't really got that they're more worried about what do we need to do first let's look at what happens but all of those options are on the table everything's still preliminary and like i said we score higher if we do something green so i'm always kind of pushing that on the team when we're talking in working group right look at that opportunity and you may have an opportunity couple opportunities on that stuff you're looking at in those channel improvements and stuff like that right so what we're doing work in the channel proper because there's a couple of places we're not just doing culverts we're looking at the creek in the middle too mm -hmm. those are the places where we're going to look to have those kind of opportunities okay because i was thinking generationally right mm -hmm. and we're forever growing and developing so since announcing this have you heard of any other additional other than what commissioner mentioned are there any other additional developers thinking about uh, building along in the portland or Alexis <coughs> area that would what we're trying to do. I thought when you were asking this question, I thought about two things. We had a meeting with Hutchins today. I figured about two things. That place is changing every day. And I mean, those guys throw that stuff up in six months. They'll put a street in, they'll throw those, those warehouses up. Because I asked him, I said, is there anything going on? And he goes, no, not I, I can tell you about right, nothing I know about right now. I said, well, give it a day or two. Right? <laughs> no, we don't know, but that place is, is just going crazy. right? And then the other thing I was going to say is, you know, because we're getting into creeks and they're, they're cottonwood creeks is what's on my mind. Um, and the place that we're looking at is full of trees and it's got a little park there and stuff. And I'm thinking, you know, we don't need to go in and change the world to do this, right? I mean, right. We can kind of leave some of all that stuff in there that's there and still make it all work. And it's this Texas Water Development Board criteria, this no impact stuff is killing this team. They're, they're working really hard come up with solutions, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't want to do it. I don't think we want to do anything that's really going to mess it up from what it already is, because it's really pretty. All that stuff's really pretty, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm trying to think of another question. It's, you identified the one area and possible two. Is that what I understood? Or did in, I misunderstand? Port Duncanville. It's that there's those two streets. It's just those, so two, those streets. two streets. And that's the only way in and out for that subdivision, right? right? So that's where we kind of nailed that in down in that. We got to be careful about, you know, we have to score, right? Now, don't be wrong. We're going to look at your stuff and say, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. Okay. Right. We're going to let you know where those are. But as far as what we're going to take forward and because we'll analyze some of the bad ones and then we'll kind of show you what you need to throw a culvert in here. But as far as being able to score well, we're only taking a certain, like I said, we started with 16, we went to seven, and really out of those seven, there's probably only two or three or four projects that we're gonna actually go through, because it's a lot of work. Yes, I understand. I work mm -hmm. in stormwater for the city of Dallas. Yeah. So I understand the work. Yeah, so you, yeah, so it's a lot, but I'm talking about it's a lot of work to fill out all that documentation and get all those costs. You gotta get mm -hmm. the cost of the buildings, you gotta get the cost of all that stuff, and then come up with this cost benefit analysis. So we wanna try to get projects, I think curated is the right word. We wanna get projects that are gonna get funded. Right, we'll tell you where the problems are, but really what we're trying to get on this list are ones that the state are going to score well and say, hey, come get some money. Right, I understand. I was asking because we do have a aging infrastructure here in the city, and it would be great to be able to take advantage um, of the funding that's available for as many of them as we possibly can. Here. You guys may want to find the next time it goes around, you may want to apply for one of these evaluations for the city and look at your storm sewer. And that's when you really start talking about your because they, they gave 75% of the money. So Lisa mentioned the COG. What piece of the, uh, you know, like I said, I'm on RTC, which is transportation. What piece of the COG is involved in this? Well, the COG is, is one of our stakeholders. We invite them to our meetings, and they certainly have the Trinity 
uh, Common Vision Program, okay. which um, helps with development along the Trinity River, where all of the floodplain managers and that are along the Trinity River, all the way from Fort Worth to Dallas, look at each other's um, permits and, and have the core review. Uh, and listen, in other words, you know, with you, it's Michael Morris, and then uh, this right. is the environmental group over oh, okay. planning and I, development. I environmental what silo properties? Side, but what portion of, of the RTC, of the COG, right. looks at this piece? And I'm sure it must interface with the RTC in some way because the transportation up down 35 or 45. Right. And Loop 9. And Loop 9. Loop 9. Loop 9. Let's not forget Loop 9. And yeah, and it's, it's the fact that every meeting of the Best Southwest Partnership, I have to give an update on Loop 9. <laughs> so, and I talk to Caesar Clemens, Season Clemens about that or, uh, almost every meeting that we get to, watching the progression of Loop 9. Absolutely. And I don't want to speak for Commissioner Price, but NETCOG knows all about being the port, though, right? I'd like for us to remember the five people we lost on Daniel Deal when that 10 mile flooded that time. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Finn Cannon? Yes. Mr. Finn Cannon, this is not an open session for citizens to express an opinion. Thank you very much for that, though. Thank you. Okay. Lives lost on a flooded roadway. Yeah. Well, thank you. Five That's all I have. <clears throat> and, and Mr. Mayor, I just want to say on April the 18th, the Southeast Area Transportation Alliance, uh, the CEDAR, which you've been a part of, but uh, April 19th will be in Cedar Valley for the sixth uh, annual Inland uh, Symposium. Uh, people from across this state and even from Louisiana, which you know that Dallas County uh, has now fashioned an MOU with the Port of Plaquemines. Uh, I think that hopefully all of your council members uh, are familiar with that. It's made all, it's going to make all the difference in terms of what's coming into that inland port. But then the sixth annual symposium will be at Cedar Valley College. And uh, it was interesting to hear either Rod, someone just said, you can put up a building in six months. Uh, takes you six years uh, to do the infrastructure. And uh, we'll, 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 we'll talk a lot about that during the, during the symposium. Buildings are going up a lot faster than yeah. uh, the infrastructure. So. One of the things, uh, Commissioner, that you mentioned <coughs> reminded me that I know I've been involved so with the IPTMA with Laura Freeland. And I know going back in time, we've talked about Plaquemines and how the issue, you know, people think, well, how in the world is Dallas impacted by what's going on down the coast in New Orleans? And it's all because of the transportation issues and bringing all that freight moving. So when, when I look at that, th these things are married so tightly together in terms of how can one piece operate without the other, and it doesn't. I don't know the IPTMA with Florida and, and several others. It's all working together. So to see this and to see the synergy of what's going on with these projects is really amazing. Because I know maybe council member at large Gooden has some understanding of what's going on the rest of us i think it's out of our wheelhouse <laughs> but we but we just got educated on what is the unknown i mean it, it's not something that we have a personal expertise in, except for maybe i have expertise <laughs> i just know enough knowledge. to be dangerous but, but, <laughs> but, 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 knowledge is enough. but, we're, but we're all connected knowledge what we saw in baltimore plaque mines is what we, historically we've talked about what's going on in Long Beach, but, wow. you know, Baltimore just reminded us uh, yep. what happens with supply chains and whole maritime piece. We're going to talk a lot about that, even at the symposium, uh, because TxDOT, you talk about season, uh, the lady, uh, Miles, that pres presented to us to District 3, oh, yeah. she is going to present uh, 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 Carolyn Mays. Carolyn Carol Carol Mays. Carol Mays. Mm -hmm. She is going to present at the uh, symposium to talk about, as you say, all the interconnectivity uh, with regards to transportation and what's going on in this region. Okay. So again, thank, thank you all for, uh, for hosting us and, and considering. Honored to have you with us, Commissioner, for all of your staff and then for the consultants as well. Very educational. Thank you very much for, for coming. Glad y'all liked it. Thank you. 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 The court, I have to go to bounds. Okay. Nice meeting you. 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 Nice me
Continuing on, we are on the consent items uh, for City Manager Finch. I think you're on what 4C. 4C, Council to consider a resolution confirming the City Manager's appointment of Greg Chase as the owner and fire chief. Uh, what I'll share with you is uh, we're fortunate to have somebody with uh, you know, the Chief Chase's uh, expertise serving 31 years for the City of Duncanville Fire Department, um, <clears throat> starting out originally as a uh, Paramedic, a driver, operator, pump, instructor, you know, fire officer, incident safety officer, then commander, master fire inspector, then you know, master firefighter, and I'm confident that he can lead us forward for the uh, Duncanville no Fire Department. I'm happy to answer any questions. <coughs> and I presume uh, Assistant Chief Chase agrees with this. He said yes to me. Oh, <laughs> I may have been twisting his arm. Well, I was wondering if you did it in the back room or something, but they, uh, we had got consent before we actually do something like that. Okay, very good. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, 4D, consider a resolution approving the interlocal agreement between the center, City of Cedar Hill, DeSoto, Lancaster, and Duncanville to partner in the Best Southwest Hispanic Heritage Celebration. And uh, I believe uh, Parks Director Stevenson is here. We were briefed on this last time. We were briefed on last time. Last and I did brief it. And so the, the independent celebration of the city of Duncan every year is included in that ILA along with the 10,000 that we contributed. So I appreciate seeing that. Any other questions on this one? Just for uh, just to be a part of it, I don't know if you were planning on sharing. We had an internal meeting about September 15th, 16th, doing our own event. Right. We're looking at some options for doing parade and some other activities for the 15th and 16th. We assure you we will have an event in the next. Okay. Hey, let me, let, let, let's do a little housekeeping, folks. We're, we're at 10 to 7. And we city manager has got to go through item K. And we haven't even touched on the briefings yet. So looking at the briefings, I don't, you know, I know that I talked to, to Mr. Finch earlier about, you know, is there any of these that we can delay in terms of time? And looking at them, it's like, I don't know. I, I'm not going to try and make a decision for y'all and speak for y'all. But looking at the briefings and understanding what we have in terms of ahead of us, um, and then, yes. Can I have questions? Yeah. So it, it's, it's, what I'm trying to do is try to put this in terms of priorities. What do we need City Manager Finch to cover? What can we accept because they're in consent? And what can we do in terms of the briefings that we have to do? Can we do them after the end of the meeting or do we dispense with them until the next meeting that we have on the 16th of April? So just open that for some for some discussion. Yeah, Mr. Thank you, Mayor. We do have Adam K. And we have our <coughs> audit firm partner that's actually having to uh, come in via Zoom. Zoom or Teams or whatever whatever we have. Is he ready? And yes. 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 So that's a top priority to get that one done. Whatever the questions that you have, it's good. So I have questions about items 4I and 4J. And if we could just move those to individual consideration, uh, that would be fine. That'll give us time to discuss it. You can do that. You can do that. So I, City Secretary, Mr. Finch, help me. No, yes. Ms. Good sits next to me. So right elbow. <laughs> I and J to individual. You know, I had a conversation. I don't know if there's a request to move. I can do the individual, but we can have an additional conversation. Is there a question on item E? You want that move that one to the individual also so we can have time to discuss it? Okay. All right. Well, that's good. So any other 
items in consent items that we want to. Wow, we've only got like six minutes. What about going back to this audit issue? Um, can that be done in six minutes or so? If not, we'll just kind of do it. And if we run over seven, we're just going to run over seven. It's probably that important, or do I read it that way? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking maybe 10 minutes. I don't think this presentation will be. Let's roll with that. Let, let's immediately go to the two item K. If we can, pull that up, Mr. Jackson. Whoever we have to get him online. While that's happening, let's take a look at the briefings, uh, the swag and briefing. I think is kind of important for the issues we've been having. Uh, my, the, the official sister recognition is my issue. I can discuss it in probably five or six minutes, but it's important because there's something coming up. Um, the lateral police officer bonus pay. Yes. Discuss that one. And the briefing on the purchase of the four by four brush fighter. It's a, it's a big dollar, it's a big dollar buy. We can go with that briefing. It's a big, okay, here's the way it's gonna look. We take all of these briefings and we move them to the end of the city council session. Okay? Because I don't wanna, I really don't wanna dispense with any of them. I think they're important enough to do. So, we'll move, what was it? Jeremy, E, E, I, and J to individual consent. E, I, and J, the individual consent. Are there any others that you wish? Well, we're not going to do it. We're, yeah. <laughs> we're just going to take the other consent items as consent items and not have the city manager brief us on those. It was all in the packet. And go immediately to the audit findings or the, uh, the audit and annual comprehensive financial report for IFK. That works with the back of that? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So uh, if anybody is listening, to let the folks know that are sitting out in council chambers that we may be running at over seven o'clock to the tune of maybe five or ten minutes over the seven o'clock time to just let them know. But they can hear it, they can see it, they can listen to it while we're in here. So it is well, he's here. Um, Mr. City Manager, can someone let the folks know out there? I just okay. We'll do our best, but uh, let them know that we're just not gonna make it at seven o'clock. Yeah, right. This one would be on the other side. Oh. So we can have Jack Collins. We're going to go to 4K right away. I'm just making my notes for E, I, and J. They're going to go to individual. Individual five. five, yeah. yeah. I'm making five to F. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's it. So, uh, e, e becomes E becomes E becomes five, five F. F. I becomes five. My mind is J. <laughs> J becomes five I. H. 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 <laughs> okay. All right. We ready to go? Yes. All right. So let me jump right into this. This is regarding the report with McConnell Jones. Uh, CFO Jackson's here, but I think the audit committee chair may have had some questions for uh, the audit firm. Well, I, I think he needs to go through his presentation. Okay. So thanks. So, and, and thank you, Chuck, for being here. Mr. Kozak, we appreciate it. Yeah, Mr. Kozak, floor is yours, sir. All right, well, thank you all. Uh, appreciate the time. I know you guys have an action-packed schedule, so I'll go through these uh, quickly. These are virtually identical slides to what was presented on March 18th to the Audit Committee. Basically, uh, there's an overview of the ACFR document itself. Uh, the city's basic financial statements, which include the government-wide financials, the fund financials, the proprietary funds, and the notes to the basic financial statements. These are, are what we audit, essentially, and, and put, put an opinion on. There's also some 
sections within the act for document itself which would remain unaudited. We performed certain limited audit procedures over these items, things like the MD&A, the RSI schedules, pension information, and the budget to actual for the general fund, as well as the other information contained in the act for. We issue an in relation to opinion that includes the introductory section and the statistical section. Just some reminders about what management's responsibilities were during the course of the audit. It's management's job to prepare and fairly present the financial statements in accordance with GAAP, to select and use the appropriate accounting policies, to establish and maintain effective internal controls, to comply with applicable laws, regulations, contracts, and grant agreements, to make any necessary adjustments to the financial statements, to correct material misstatements, to design and implement programs of control, programs and controls to prevent and detect fraud, to assume all management responsibilities for assistance provided during the audit, and to make written representations to the auditors. In terms of the audit results, we issued three reports, the first being the independent auditor's report on the financial statements. It was our responsibility as auditors to express an opinion on the financial statements based on our audit as performed under generally accepted auditing standards. We issued an unmodified or clean opinion on the financial statements that was dated March 15, 2024. We obtained an understanding of internal control relevant to the audit for identifying and assessing the risks of material misstatement. However, it wasn't for the purpose of expressing an opinion on the operation of such controls. And as I mentioned, we performed some limited procedures over the required supplementary information, the MD&A, the budget comparison schedules, and the pension schedules. The second report that we issued was what's called the report on internal control over financial reporting and on compliance and other matters based on an audit of financial statements performed in accordance with government auditing standards. It's a mouthful, I know. It's shortened, commonly referred to as the Yellow Book Report. In this report, we speak about the operation of internal controls, and we note any internal control findings that we identified. We did identify one material weakness, no significant deficiencies, however. The material weakness was kind of an overarching issue with regard to financial reporting in general. There was a number of bullets in that finding that we issued, noting several issues, again, in the financial reporting shop, the ability to produce financials, the number of adjustments that we had in order to get the financial statements to be fairly stated. The turnover that occurred in the finance shop, which again, kind of exacerbated some of the issues that we identified. Further, in that Yellow Book Report, we didn't note any instances of noncompliance, so that's a good thing. The third and last report that we issued was a report on compliance for each major federal program, report on internal control over compliance, and a report on the schedule of expenditures of federal awards that's required by the uniform guidance, again, commonly referred to as the single audit report. In that report, we issued an opinion on the major federal program that was audited, the Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds. Happy to report there were no instances of noncompliance, no deficiencies in internal control identified over this program, and the SEPA was found to be fairly stated in relation to the financial statements. So that's the extent of my remarks. Again, it matches what was reported back on the 18th to the Audit Committee. I'm happy to field any questions that you might have. Mr. McBride, any comments you'd like to make since the Chair of the Audit Committee? I would, and I'd like to say thank you again for, well, I want to say to Mr. Jackson and Mr. Finch and company for making this a priority and getting this thing finally resolved because 
this was due really 11 and a half months ago and, and stuff and and mr kozik you you did it but the bullet points that i that i wanted to say is that, that one that the city was able to produce timely reliable financial statements and provide adequate supporting documents that's one of the things you had an inordinate number of material adjustments were needed to make the financial statements to be fairly in accordance with, with gap three the city was unable to satisfactorily reconcile its cash balances timely four the city did not accurately post entries to assure the actor the net position and five the material difference was no between the city's general ledger and the emergency ambulance services vendor records uh, uh, service revenue uh, was there was there any other recommendations or was there any other things that, that you would say that, that we needed or, or or have been addressed or will need to be addressed? Again, the, the internal control and environment that we were speaking about was for fiscal year 22. You know, and, and if you look at your, your calendar, obviously that was quite a while ago. Um, so a lot has happened and changed in the interim. I would echo the comments that um, Mr. Jackson and uh, Ms. Hickman's job, um, you know, they did a, a great job kind of picking up the pieces and, and seeing this through um, and helping us get to the finish line. Um, it, was a, it was a long road, um, you know, as a, it's an understatement to say that. But um, again, I, I think we were able to get the financial statements to a point and satisfy ourselves as the auditors that they're fairly stated, but it was a lot of back and forth. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of adjustments needed to take place in order to get the financial statements um, to where they needed to be to be fairly stated. Okay. And does a, does a, a so-called clean opinion, um, I know that's what we've had, but, but uh, or, or that's how it's stated, but... Um, Would, would you say that you got everything that you needed to fairly do this? So, again, the clean opinion refers to an unmodified opinion over the financial statements. That's basically saying the numbers as presented, we believe them to be fairly stated. There's no qualifications, no modifications to our opinion. So that's what's referred to as a clean opinion. In terms of the internal control environment, you know, that's the yellow book report. And just because we were able to get their, um, you know, the numbers to be fairly stated, doesn't mean that there, there weren't a lot of internal control deficiencies, which together kind of rolled up into this material weakness over financial reporting. Um, again, there's, there's several, I guess, issues, you know, and it had to do with the turnover. It had to do with um, the ability to generate the reports um, accurately and, and, you know, on time and, and the ability to then compile all the financial information and present a set of financials that would be ready for an auditor to look at and to be ready for audit. So, again, just because we got there, you know, on the, the numbers on the financial statements, doesn't mean that there weren't a lot of internal control kind of bumps along the way, which which caused this audit to take so long. Thank you. I, I don't have any more questions. Is any? So the only, it's just a, I don't know if it's a comment or a question, uh, Mr. Koslick, but read through some of the information we talked about the Gasby's mm -hmm. and when you issue that modified clean report as you stated there on the chart, that how does that affect your opinion of how the city is doing with compliance with GASP? So again, the numbers got there and we believe they're fairly presented in accordance with the GASB standards. Um, in order to get the numbers there, like I said, there was a lot of back and forth and a lot of you know, we would be presented something for audit, 
you know, like a cash reconciliation, and it wouldn't reconcile. <laughs> so we had to kick it back, you know, to the finance shop and say, hey, this this doesn't reconcile. That's the whole point of a reconciliation, right? Um, is that management is is doing the blocking and tackling, whether it's monthly reconciliations or or annually preparing their financials, and and they're you know, you, there shouldn't be a lot of back and forth there. It should just be, hey, we've, we've put this through, you know, our financial system. We've generated a reconciliation. We've reviewed it ourselves. And now here it is. It's ready for audit. And there shouldn't be many, you know, many issues at all, um, ideally. But, but no, in this case, um, and again, there was a lot of, I think, reasons why. Um, it, it, there was a lot of back and forth. And, and just by nature of that back and forth, the internal control environment was lacking, you know, during the year under audit, for sure. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Kozlik. I know that our previous city council meeting, you committed to providing this on a particular day. Mm -hmm. I believe that commitment was met. Uh, so we're very appreciative of having this report available for us today and being able to move on with it. So thank you very much. Uh, to you and all of your staff for helping us with this. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. All right. We're at 710, so I'm going to go out there and give a briefing or just bring people up to date on the housekeeping in terms of how we're going to address the rest of the meeting. So if you need a quick break, please do so, and let's go ahead and meet. Um, out there, and I did know one thing the agenda shows an executive session, but we don't have an executive session. No, we don't. No, okay. there's a no, line that it, shows that yeah. it's always on there. Yes, case, there just was. Case, oh, yeah, that's right. Case, that's where they go. Case is called for. Right. That's where they go. That's so, where they go. we do not. There's no executive session. There is not. I want to make sure. Uh, oh, just uh, <laughs> 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 the only item I, I have for I the calendar it. is the fire station grand opening on May the 3rd at 2 o'clock p.m. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. 3 May, 1400. I see. Thank you. You're <laughs> Thank you. Like, I circled it another one. And I still forgot. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Let's move out to the chambers. We need a quick break. We need to do so.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for your patience. City Secretary, uh, calling to order our open city council meeting. The timestamp is 718. Uh, Pastor Dr. Abril Goforth had an emergency call and she had to leave and to, our, to do our invocation, so we're sorry for that, but we know she had some responsibilities that she had to take care of. So uh, with that, um, Mr. Mac Burnett, would you give us our invocation, please? Thank you, Mayor. I'd love to. Please rise. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the blessings you bestowed upon us. We want to thank you for walking with us. We want to thank you for being that guide and that beacon of light for us. Please guide us, love our city, care for our city, have us serve you and glorify in your son's name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please join me in pledges to our flags. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Please be seated. Okay, so uh, again, our apologies for being late. So there is some housekeeping that we need to do. We gave preference to Commissioner John Wiley Price in his presentation that he gave on a floodplain study tonight that took a little bit of time. So what happened is, is that we we're not able to give any of the briefings that we had on our agenda, uh, specifically in paragraphs 3A, 3B, 3D and 3E, we're going to have those briefings tonight. They will be at the end of the city council meeting after the briefings from staff. Make a note of that. Oh, one other thing looking, uh, Mr. Vera Cruz is absent tonight. City Secretary, make a record of that in our minutes for that. Okay, and in addition, because of the time factor, we still needed some items to move from, in, from consent to individual, cons individual consideration because some council members still wanted to discuss those. So it's a technicality that we would normally discuss those during the briefing session from the city manager while we're in the, in the briefing room. However, we are moving those to individual consent. So if you, if you have your agenda, looking at the consent agenda items 5I, I'm sorry, 4I. Four four. Four oh, yep, 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 there's it. Thank you very much. I always get help. Always got help. Always take help too. <laughs> so item 4E is going to individual consideration and will become item 5F, as in Fox. Item 4I, as in 4 India, becomes 5G, as in 5 Golf. And consent item 5J is in Juliet. I'm sorry, 4J is in Juliet, becomes 5H as in five hotel. So those three items will be moving to the individual consideration. And the council has agreed that the rest of the items for the consent agenda are gonna be going forward in a singular motion as we normally do. So with that, uh, just wanted to let you know, it, I think that's the housekeeping. Anything housekeeping I left out? Covered it, all right, very well, okay. Uh, moving on to the reports, going to the mayor's report. Uh, council members, I have some things to discuss that are going to take in excess of three minutes. So I would like to accept a motion to allow me to exceed so three moved. minutes. Second. So moved uh, by Mr. Kuntz to go beyond three minutes, seconded by Mr. Uh, Mac Burnett. Please vote on allowing me more than three minutes. Unanimously approved. Thank you. I want to thank our Parks and Recreation staff, Noel Garcia, Bart Stevenson, the rest of the staff for doing an incredible job with the egg extravaganza on Saturday. And I know that Councilmember Mac Burnett, Councilmember Vera Cruz, and Councilmember Gooden uh, were present for that. And it was just a wonderful time. There was 
Oh, yep. Mr. Kuntz was there after me. I saw you roaming around with your, with your herd. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Clan. What? <laughs> tis I, tis I. This is the way it is. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so they had 13,000 eggs to be distributed. And to watch that and see the long line of parents and kids waiting to have their, their picture taken with, I guess, what do we call it, Peter Rabbit? The rabbit? <laughs> the rabbit. The Easter Bunny. The Easter, yeah, the Easter Bunny. Peter Rabbit comes, I don't know where that comes from here. So it was a great time and very happy and for that. The uh, one other one thing I wanted to make mention of is the pro the what we have is property improvement program the PIP, the PIP is coming up very soon and the houses have been selected by the committee to where the work is going to be done on those property improvements, but the volunteers are needed. Now the the vol this organ this is organized through the First United Methodist Church, and so if you would like to volunteer to work on any of the PIP houses please contact the First United Methodist Church and they'll be happy to put you on a crew to, to help build or paint. Actually, they can take anybody to do anything. You don't have to be a, a master handy person or something, just anybody would like to volunteer and help out. They'll certainly like to have you for that. Another announcement we have is April 6th. We're going to formally open Kidsville and we're going to start the splash pad. And it's going to be a wonderful opportunity. The chairperson of the Parks and Recreation Commission, the board, is going to be there, Beth Farrell. And I will press the button to start the engines or start the motors for the splash pad. Now, one thing that uh, we've been told is that these motors kind of gear up. Uh, so we're going to count down from 30 <laughs> to where these motors actually have full pressure to pressurize the entire splash pad. So put that on your calendars for April the 6th. And that's at 4 o'clock? 4 o'clock. Yeah, thank you very much. And also on your calendars, you can see that we've been putting on our marquee that we're going to have dark in the park, and this is the celebration or the recognition of the eclipse. We're right in the center of the path of the to of total solar eclipse. Our Parks and Rec Department has arranged some stuff on the 7th and the 8th, and the details all been put together by a special events coordinator by Angela Owens. You can look on our website and get all the details for that, but the 7th and 8th are something very, very special. Now, one thing that we would like to caution our citizens about, and this is from our police department, please do not stop on our major thoroughfares to watch the eclipse because there's going to be congestion. We know that. There's going to be a lot of vehicles coming into the city that may not have been here before, non-residents. But please, if you know anybody, tell them not to stop on the streets in the traffic while this is going on. You can, and some of our churches have already said it's fine for people to come into their parking lots, go into a grocery store parking lot, but please don't congest our streets. We want to be very careful of that. So the next thing I would like to do is I have someone, some people that I would like to recognize as champions of the city. And I would like to do this during the mayor's report. So with that, I'm going to, to move down there. And I'd like to call up John and Charlotte Gaia. It is always my honor and my pleasure to recognize individuals on in our city that contribute to our city and have done a wonderful job in making this the city of champions. And with that, I have created a, a, a recognition called champion of the city. And sometimes when I recognize more than one person, it's champions of the city. So, the, oh, okay. This one says, this is champions. This one's the right one. So I would like to read about John and Charlotte Guyon. The Guyons met while attending Dunkerville High School and remained faithful residents of the city. They were married at the First Baptist Church of Duncanville 49 years ago. Charlotte is a graduate of UT Southwestern Medical School. John is a graduate of Dallas Baptist University. Following graduation from college, Charlotte began a 40-year career with the Dallas Veterans Medical Center. 
Her devotion to veterans is a result of her father's experience on board the USS Maryland on December 7, 1941, during the attack on Pearl Harbor. John began a 45-year career in the Dallas banking community at First National Bank of Duncanville, now known as Chase Bank. While attending Duncanville High School, Charla was a member of the hi-hat drill team serving as lieutenant her senior year. The Guyons daily serve with the senior lunch program at the Hopkins Senior Center and volunteer at the Midlothian Pause for Reflections Ranch, a therapy ranch serving veterans and special needs youth where they assist the counselors and therapists with therapeutic horseback riding and other special field trip events. During the 2023-2024 school year, Charla learned that the traditional Duncanville Panther mascot was not on the sidelines at the football games. Since no student volunteered, Charla became the Panther mascot and was honored to appear on the 18 team Megatron screen during the Duncanville State Championship game. As mayor of the city of Duncanville, I ask our residents to join me in congratulating John and Charla Guyon on this memorable occasion. And in recognition also, I have a medallion from the city of Duncanville for you to take home and place in some place of special recognition. So, John, Charla, the microphone is yours. You'd like to say something. I know you have a special guest with you, too. Dr. Dawson, I found my hi-hat from 1970. So this is nostalgic. Uh, raise your hand. Does everyone know who the director of the Hi-Hats? Raise your hand. There she is. She is amazing, more than amazing. And I participated in the homecoming, the uh, routine that we did on the field. And that's when I asked, where's the mascot and um, found out there wasn't so I said I can totally do that so I learned two things as the mascot you can't talk and that was hard for me not to talk because <laughs> you don't want to give away the character and then secondly someone warned me if the other team opposing team is losing they may come around and kind of rough you up I said oh and I said, wait a minute that's me I'm the mascot they're talking about me so in the Mansfield game, November the 2nd, here came their mascot and their cheerleaders. I thought, this is it. They're going to beat me up. So here they came, and I thought, they are not going to mess with this grandmother because I'm not going to let that happen. And they came. It was total opposite. They were so kind, and their mascot name was Rocky. So we, we shook. We couldn't say anything. And then our wonderful band kicked into a really good beat, so I tried to teach him the floss. It's called the floss. Some of y'all younger ones surely know what the floss is. S yes. So we did that. And then the cheerleader said, oh, Rocky has a girlfriend. They had no idea a 68-year-old lady was in that costume. So that was an, an experience. Um, Officer Johnson, come over here. Come here. Different hat. Oh, you're going to have to get on your knees for me to get closer. No, you don't have to do that. <laughs> this is our hero, and we, they're also human, and I think we forget that. They keep us safe, and can we give them a round of applause? Please do such a good job, and they are so underrated. So thank you for all you do. You. And that's it. Thank Did I keep? I, I stuck to the rule of brevity. I stayed short. I didn't talk too much. <laughs> John? Thank you, Mayor. Oh, she said enough. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We need more photographs.
Thank you, City Council, for allowing me to take that extra time and to recognize some extraordinary people. Uh, third, third thing on to council members' reports. Any city council members' reports? Uh, Mr. Koontz. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to thank uh, our crime prevention officer, uh, Arias, and uh, interim police chief, Stogner, for meeting with myself and just a, a couple of guys from my neighborhood in Forest Hills to discuss starting a neighborhood watch in the neighborhood. And during that meeting, I was shocked to discover that there are no active watches in the city, no active neighborhood watches in the city. And so uh, we had a great meeting. It was very informative. And starting a neighborhood watch is very, very, very simple, very simple. And you can just start from with one or two people and build it from there. So I want to encourage uh, everyone in your neighborhood to maybe find a person or two that lives in your neighborhood and set up a meeting with um, Officer Arias, and she'll get you started and, and kind of teach you how to get things organized. But then it's in your hands. But neighborhood watches have been proven to be very effective uh, in, in, uh, in preventing crime and stopping crime and discouraging crime in the neighborhoods. It's an opportunity for you to get to know your neighbors in your neighborhood and to get everybody informed about just some of the criminal activity that's taking place in the neighborhood. So. Just want to encourage everybody, you know, again, find one or two people on your block, uh, meet with Officer Arias, and, and you'll be on your way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McBurnett. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, kind of reiterating some of the stuff that the Mayor said, I mean, last week in the, the Easter egg hunt was, was, I mean, it was fabulous. Kidsville was open, I mean, and, and people got to see that, and it's, and it's that. So we've got all that going on, but also on Saturday the 6th is Operation Clean Duncanville, and also there's a movie in the park afterwards. So it's a whole day that you can spend in Duncanville as well. And then on uh, the, the 25th of April, the, the police department uh, has the light of hope at Lakeside Park. And also on the 30th of April is the first Lad Fest that's actually going to be held at... Uh, the uh, Senior Citizen Center as well. Uh, I also want to say that thankfully uh, our audit for uh, <laughs> our audit has it's a year and a half well it's I'm sorry it's it's we finally got an audit done and, and I'm so glad and I want to commend the staff for for finally getting this thing focused and getting it done and the bumps and bruises and that that have gone through this uh, you know the the auditor basically gave what he would refer to as a, a clean opinion but i would also tell you to go look in the website and and under departments and fiscal services there's a transparency section in there and I would strongly suggest you go and look at that because you're going to see the issues that we had to endure over this time and with things made and said. So uh, kudos. And I, and I also want to commend our city manager and, and financial staff as well because the recommendations off of the management letter, they've already put some of these things in place. And the, the new, the 23 was actually due at the end of, of March, but they're making the steps and they've taken good measures to do this. And so I want to thank you for being responsible and accountable and, and moving things in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gooden. Thank you, Mayor. I also want to agree with everything that the Mayor said um, about the extravaganza and all the activities that happened um, during this past weekend. Thank you so much, Mr. Stevenson, and also to uh, Mr. Tyler and your team. Um, excellent job. We had a great time. Um, last week, our last council meeting, I recognized women here uh, for providing services and neglected to mention two who really take good care of us, Ms. Chiquita Taylor and Karen Smith, 
Thank you so much for a job well done. Um, you do such a good job with taking care of counsel, and I want to extend my deepest gratitude to you and say thank you for all that you do. I appreciate it. Sorry that I left your names out. To the citizens of Duncanville, um, City of Champions, thank you so much for all of your engagement. Um, feeling free to contact, ask questions, getting involved. Thank you just so much for paying attention. I would encourage you to continue to do so. Watch, um, hold us accountable when need be. And thank you so much for all of your questions that you bring to us. And for the PIP days, I too participate in PIP, been participating for the last couple of years. It is a good opportunity for us to find a way to give back to those who necessarily need home improvements. You don't have to be a master anything to participate. Come out, have a good time. We have citizens who come and participate, do whatever work you can, and you're not really necessarily having to stay there all day. Just work around your schedule. Whatever you can give, I'm sure they would appreciate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any further council members' reports? Okay, seeing none, city manager's report. Yes, Mayor, thank you, and Council. Um, I'd like to start out by uh, recognizing retired Fire Chief uh, Sam Rohde for his 39 years of service to the city of Duncanville and the residents of the city of Duncanville. Uh, I'll be sharing with you additional information on how we'll recognize him and honor him in the very near future. Uh, secondly, we have quite a few firefighters here this evening, and they're here in support of uh, the, the, their chief. Uh, I had the honor of of speaking with many of them um, over breakfast, uh, the entire city administration, the month of uh, January and February, and they made it loud and clear that when the time came, they were supporting Greg Chase to be the interim fire chief. And so there's a resolution on the agenda this evening. It's my honor to um, uh, recommend to you uh, my interim appointment as uh, Greg Chase as the interim fire chief and thank him for his 31 years of service to the residents of the city of Duncanville. Um, additionally, uh, while we're on the subject of fire department, uh, congratulations to everybody involved. I know our uh, firefighters are super happy to be in the new Station 271. Um, and, and I have to tell you, there, there was a lot of staff working on this, public works and everything, but there was, there was a man behind the scenes who was really making sure that everything came together, and that is the interim fire chief, Greg Chase. And uh, Chief... I mean, just kudos to you for all the work, the late hours, and everything you did to make sure that that fire station got open and that was going to be able to accurately and, and adequately, I should say, uh, serve our firefighters and our residents uh, during those emergency response times. So thank you. Uh, just uh, real quickly, two other things. Certainly, uh, just in the, in the essence of time, we're super excited to welcome our new project manager, uh, Portia Hogg, who started this past week. will be working with us on a lot of different projects across the city. Um, I also want to recognize Budget Administrator Jennifer Ote. <clears throat> All of her work as we're kicking off the budget process uh, right now. We're starting with meetings. And finally, I want to uh, thank uh, Ms. Steger for uh, Ride Along. I did a ride along with her with Citizens on Patrol and uh, learned a lot from her perspective. So thank you. So, and that's it, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Finch. Moving on to item number three on the agenda <coughs> Citizens Input. In-person citizen comments will be heard during the regular session in keeping with the City Council's Rules of Procedure, adopted on October the 18th, 2022. Electronic mail comments will no longer be read aloud. Paper copies will be provided to the Council at the dais, and the comments will be part of the public record in the minutes. And for information, we do have two items in front of us that have been presented to the Council members. Pursuant to Section 551.007 of the Texas Government Code, any member of the public has the opportunity to address the City Council concerning any matter of public business on any, any posted agenda item. However, the Act prohibits the City Council from delivering any issues not on the public agenda, and such non-agenda issues may be referred to City staff for research and any future action. All persons addressing are subject to Council-adopted rules and limitations permitted by law. And for the City of the Duncanville, you individuals who wish to speak have two minutes and that is timed at the, with a timer on the lectern as well as the city secretary timing that. So at that time, I'm going to call forward the individuals who have submitted cards to speak, and I'm calling them forward in the order that have been given to me. And when you come forward, please give your name and address for the record. 
Patrick Harvey. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Patrick Harvey here, 1010 Huntington, Duncanville, Texas, 75137. Been living in Duncanville since 1989. What I would like uh, to do is to express a personal note of thanks and appreciation to council members Mac Burnett, Kuntz, and Contreras who joined with me in rendering the difficult decision to charter a new course one year and three days ago. This new course required the elimination of the ineffectiveness and inefficiency rooted in the previous uh, city management, both the external audit schedule of findings and the city attorney's report on the forensic audit go into great detail explaining the circumstances that brought a once great finance department to its knees. I acknowledge the efforts of the new city manager and finance director to right the ship, but there is more work that needed to, needs to be done. Uh, as Councilmember Mac Burnett said, there's another audit. And to echo your words, Mr. Finch, it's time to do the budget. So uh, I hope that you will continue to maintain your focus and enthusiasm to getting this done. Thanks so much. Thank you. Mark Graham. Mark Graham, 410 Santa Fe Trail. Um, this was specifically about the uh, agreement between the master naturalists and, and the city. I don't understand why this is taking so long. I, I, this is a pure, complete volunteer effort. We had so many people involved when this all started. We're trying to get more volunteers now to come down and help, and we just keep having these walls. And I don't understand why these walls are such a big deal for you guys. I don't get it. We do this because we want to. We will continue doing this because we want to. But at some point in time, when you keep getting these walls, people are just going to give up. And the master naturalists are as good a group as you're going to get to take care of that land. There is a network of people that want to come down and take care of that land. They do it every weekend throughout Dallas. We need to be networking and getting that done. And instead, we're talking about an agreement that just can't get done. Please, it's time to get it done. Thanks. Thank you. Homer Fincana. Homer Fen Cannon, 546 Wind River Drive, Duncanville, Texas, a resident since 1961. And I've got all my taxes paid on that. Uh, I, I, I wrote on there tonight, this is about easements. You know, when you come out here and you buy in Duncanville, in Fairmeadows where I live, there's over 900 homes. So they took, the city took uh, out of that width of the lot is 70 feet they took eight feet so you count that up that's quite a few square feet and they said well they're going to use the gas line the electric line the cable line the telephone line which they have for all these 60 some years or so i've lived there 
but they're not, they say we've got to mow it and everything, but they run the big heavy trucks down there. And there's big gullies in there now with water standing. There will be the West now pretty soon. I know there's already the uh, cow flu out in the West may be moving in. That's transported by birds, by the way, uh, one of my favorite subjects. Uh, so I, I think the city needs to get together. If not, I've, I've got a bid in on a, a dump truck, and we'll get our citizens together, and we'll take care of our own problem over there, but you need to pay us for it because that's city land. You took it away from us. In other parts of the city, there's concrete, and you maintain that concrete for the people, and that's fine. They paid for it when they bought the houses. Maybe I didn't pay as much. My house cost me $6,700. Well, I could afford to get something a little better, but I love it there. And I think, I think that this city needs to figure out a plan. I've got another one, but I ain't going to talk about it tonight. It'd make the hair stand up on the back of your head. And it includes bugs. But anyway, you need to look into that situation. And I'm happy somebody said there's some volunteer work because I ran into a lady that she had her gas shut off. I was going door to door and they wouldn't hook up her gas, so we'll get that taken care of. Thank you. Thank you. Emily Bridges. Emily Bridges, 418 Oleander, 75137. I first wanted to thank our city manager for doing all of the district meetings. I made it to a couple, and it's very informative, and I appreciate it. The second one is there's a lot, I came here before to talk about potholes and flooding on Acton Avenue, and that's been being dealt with for probably about a month now, and I really appreciate it. It's looking a lot better, and we're expanding all the way down Acton, so I like that. Now, um, a few days ago, whatever day, it was extremely windy, not today. Um, there were trash cans at the field house. I don't know if they were intentionally knocked over or accidentally but they were knocked over the car wash that's right here. I think it's Superstar. The place is covered with litter. Dumpsters wide open. The wind is taking it everywhere. It's at 7-Eleven off 67. All of these buildings are in Duncanville. I mean, and these are just three. But I don't know how or who I need to talk to about maybe starting like a clean Duncanville initiative, as in just pertaining to litter and stains everywhere, but I would like to be part of that conversation whenever that gets going. Thank you. Thank you. Gail Slager. Gail Slager, 1405 South Main, Duncanville, Texas. At this very podium on March 30th, 2023, former finance director Richard Summerlin was accused by the attorney representing former city manager Aretha Farrell Benavides of keeping two sets of books, implying that there was intent to deceive or misrepresent. In the 14 years Mr. Summerlin was the finance director of this city, the audit report states all bank statements were reconciled at the closing of each month. The year-end books were closed in a timely manner and ready for financial audit. Not one time did the audit find there were two sets of books. Mr. Summerlin did, to protect this city, keep a spreadsheet to back up the financial system, the reporting system, which the audit report states is used by 90% of city financial directors. The spreadsheet is used as a tool to prepare budgets and then roll the data into the financial system. Note, after Mr. Summerlin departure in the 
the 2021 audit was two months late and the 2021 2022 audit was 11 and a half months late this port clearly clears Summerlin of city manager Aretha Farrell Benavides accusations of keeping two sets of books thank you Patricia Ebert Patricia Ebert, 115 South Greenstone, 75116. At 11.06 p.m. Easter Sunday night, I called 911. Out in front of my street, two houses down, was a group of young men and women yelling, shoving, screaming, hollering. So I called dispatch. And the dispatch man asked me my situation, my address, my name. And, he, and I told him there was the young ones yelling. And they were hitting a truck that was sitting there, that was parked on the street. And it's always parked there in front of the house. And I wasn't sure if they were shoving each other or they were just hitting on the truck. But it was a commotion. And the dispatch said, I hear that. And he said, can you tell if they have any weapons? And I said, I can't see that in the dark to tell you that. And right then, gunshots rang out. And the dispatcher said, get in the house and be safe. And within three minutes, two squad cars were two houses down on Greenstone. Three minutes later, four squad cars. They hit the ground running. They took control of the situation. They started looking for the spent shell casings. They talked to everybody, made reports. They were there from 11.09 to 12.31. They took care of the situation knowing it, was gonna, it could be dangerous when they got there, no more gunshots, no more commotion. They took control of the situation. The card that's just been handed to me is does not have a name, but there's an address of 3816 Castle Hills Drive. Is that person present and wishes to speak? Please identify yourself and your address once again for the record, please. And you have two minutes to speak. My name is Future Madam POTUS, the next president of the United States of America. We need a name, please. Future Madam POTUS. It's legally Future Madam POTUS. You have president. legally changed your name Legally to changed that. to president of the United States, yes. I grew up in Duncanville my freshman year to south, uh, senior year, and I'm just out and about letting people know that I'm running for president of the United okay, States. Okay, I need to stop you because it. we do not have electioneering during this period of time. So if you're talking okay. about elections, you may no, not, not continue. Okay. Yeah, you may I not continue if you're talking about your election or any other election, you may not continue. All right, thank you. I just wanted to get my name, that's all. Please, please. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right, moving on to our consent agenda. Let's finish up with the housekeeping so everybody understands where we're at. The city secretary reads the consent agenda items and that they are motioned to be approved in an aggregate. So we will have items 4A, 4B, 4C, 4D, 4F, 4G, 4H, and 4K, read by the city secretary. Items 4E, 4I and 4J have been moved to items for individual consideration. City Secretary, if you would please read the consent agenda items. Thank you, Mayor. Item 4A, consider the minutes for the March 19th, 2024 City Council regular meeting. Item 4B, consider an ordinance with the City of Duncanville, Texas, amending ordinance 2502 by amending section three annual pay scale for the classified posi positions under civil service in the police and fire departments. 
providing for a pay scale under civil service, repealing all ordinances in conflict here, herewith, and providing a severability clause, providing a repealing clause. Item 4C, Council to consider a resolution confirming the city manager's appointment of Greg Chase as the interim fire chief. Item 4D, consider a resolution approving an interlocal agreement between the city of Cedar Hill, Texas, the city of DeSoto, and, and the city of Lancaster, and the city of Duncanville to partner in the Best Southwest Hispanic Heritage Celebration, which is attached herein as Exhibit A. Item 4F, consider amending the City of Duncanville Ordinance Chapter 12B, Parks, Rec Parks Rules and Regulations, to introduce new rules and regulations specifically tailored for the operation, safety, and maintenance of splash pads. Item 4G, consider a resolution authorizing a five-year procurement of police ammunition from GT Distributors, Inc., Austin, Texas, through by board contract number 698-23 with a contingency amount not to exceed $627,000, authorizing the city manager, manager to execute the necessary documents providing for a non-appropriation clause. Item 4H, consider a resolution authorizing an amendment for IFB 20-018 with Elite Striping LLC for pavement markings, supply and installation services for an additional estimated expenditure amount of $53,529. Item 4K, consider a resolution acknowledging receipt of the Independent Audit and Annual Comprehensive Financial Report provided by McConnell and Jones LLP for the Fiscal year ended September 30th, 2022. Thank you, City Secretary. Chair will entertain a motion to approve. Mr. McMurnett. So moved. Motion to approve by Mr. McMurnett. Second, please. Second. Second by Council Member Gooden. Council, please vote. Unanimously approved. Thank you. Uh, Council, with your permission, there is an item that I think needs just a little bit more elaboration or appreciation on our part. Uh, interim now official interim fire chief greg chase please come forward thank you congratulations appreciation you and your staff, all the firefighters here, we appreciate all that you're doing, Pastor. Pastor. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, I take this responsibility with the highest of honor uh, to stand in front of these crews and lead them. Uh, it, it's an honor. I can't, you know, can't express enough gratitude to you and the kind words from the city manager. So thank you very much. Got a great crew. Thank you. All right, just uh, gotten a little more assistance. <laughs> it's always, um, and it goes to a briefing that we're going to have later on, on Swagget. And one of the items that we have noticed in looking at the recordings of our city council sessions is that the votes that are taken when they appear electronically up here, sometimes Swagget has a little bit of time not to get up there. Uh, so with Swagget, uh, tech crew and city secretary, if you would leave those lights on just a longer, I don't know how we can get a, a high sign from somebody to say that it's actually been recorded with enough time or just maybe count to 10 or something. Some, some way to ensure that the votes are showing up electronically and what they are. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Finch, for that assistance. Thank you. We're okay, we're on items five for items for individual consideration. At, we did not have an executive session, so we're dispensing with item 5A. Item 5B, 
conduct a public hearing and consider an ordinance amending the comprehensive zoning ordinance and map as heretofore amended by revoking a special use permit SUP for use of religious institution ordinance number 21324 on property currently zoned as commercial district located at 310 East Redbird Lane. Uh, before Mr. Warren proceeds, let me give the rules that we have adopted here in the city of Duncan for public hearings. When we open the public hearings, there's a timestamp on it. First of all, the, the staff member will present the, the item. Once the staff member presents the item, we will then go to the public hearing. We will open the public hearing with a timestamp, and those individuals present who wish to speak in favor of the item have 10 minutes to speak in the aggregate. So that means if there's 10 or 15 people here, the time to speak in favor is only 10 minutes for all that in total. I will then call forward any individuals who wish to speak in opposition to the item. The same 10-minute rule applies. After the public hearings are made, and that 10 minutes for each side, I will then ask for a motion to close the public hearings. We will vote on closing the public hearings with a timestamp, and then we will come back to the individual that's presenting from staff, and that will be open discussion between the council members and possibly an applicant if the applicant is present. Those are the rules we have adopted for the city of Duncanville as public hearings are made. So, Mr. Warren, item 5B is yours, sir. Thank you, Mayor Council. I'm Nathan Warren, Director of Planning and Zoning. This item is to rescind a specific use permit at 310 East Redbird Lane. So, the existing use is for a religious institution on the property. The zoning district is commercial zoning district. The use permitted by right is place of worship. So, this is just a cleanup of the existing uh, zoning map. The image on the left is a aerial of the subject property. Image on the right is the zoning map showing where the specific use permit uh, previously was, where it's timed out and where we're cleaning up the zoning, uh, zoning map with this routine uh, uh, action in which it will return to commercial zoning district. 12 mailings were sent out. There were no responses in favor or in opposition. Staff recommendation is for approval, as was the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation, approval by a vote of 5 to 0. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. It is now time that I would open the public hearing. The time stamp city secretary is 8.06 p.m. Any individuals who wish to speak in favor of this item, please come forward. Seeing none, any individuals present who wish to speak in opposition to this item, please come forward. Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Well, motion to close the public hearing, Mr. McMurnett, a second by Ms. Gooden. Council, please vote on closing the public hearing. Unanimously approved. The time stamp would be 807. And council members, working together with Swagget, leave your lights on just a little bit longer. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, now it's time for open discussion. Uh, Mr. Warren, just a quick question. As I understand, reading everything, and as you stated as well, this is a cleanup. Yes. And what we're taking is an SUP that essentially didn't need to be there because what they're doing in that in that three in that address is uh, permitted by right. That's correct. Okay. So that's what we're doing. We're just making it so they I guess going back in time by right means they could have done that without an SUP or today they could do it without an SUP because it's listed they could do it by right. So, Precisely. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions of Mr. Contreras? Just very quick, and you may have mentioned this at the onset of your presentation. Um, so the temple is still active and operating there? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none, the chair will attend a motion, Mr. Cherry. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Cherry Brown. Trying to understand. So it is active. That's what I guess I was confused on. And so we are saying we no longer want them to be able to use this property. We're, we're sending the SUP. So uh, once upon a time, uh, there was an SUP required to mm -hmm. operate on this property. 
However, that's no longer the case under our current okay. uh, zoning ordinance. Uh, places of worship are permitted by right in the commercial zoning district. Okay. Therefore, this SUP is no longer uh, ne I needed. You. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, Mr. McBurnett. I want to make the motion to approve. Motion to approve, Mr. McMurnett. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Cruzeros. Council, please vote and leave your lights on for just a bit, please. Unanimously approved. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to item 5C. Conduct a public hearing and consider an ordinance amending the comprehensive zoning ordinance and map as heretofore amended by revoking special use permit SUP for Barber School. Ordinance number 2354 on property currently zoned as local office slash retail district located at 1210 South Main Street. Mr. Warren. Thank you, Mayor Council. So we have another uh, SUP that is uh, no longer needed to clean up to the uh, zoning map where there was uh, previously a barber school that required an SUP uh, on the property at 1210 South Main Street. The existing zoning is LOR, Local Office Retail District. Uh, today, the use, uh, school biz business, trade, or vocational is permitted by right on that property. Image on the left shows the subject site. Image on the right uh, shows the zoning of that subject site where it is surrounded by LOR and the subject site being a specific use permit. Uh, that really doesn't need to be an SUP uh, anymore. 17 mailings were sent out. We had no responses in favor or in opposition. Staff is in recommendation of approval of this request. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval by a vote of five to zero as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. It's time to open a public hearing on this item. City Secretary, the timestamp is 8-11. Any individuals present who wish to speak in favor of this SUP, please come forward. Or for this item, I should say. Please come forward. Seeing none, any individuals present who wish to speak in opposition to this item, please come forward. Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Mr. McMahon has moved to close the public hearing. The second? Second. Second by Councilmember Cherry Brown. Council, please vote on closing the public hearing. Unanimously approved. The time stamp, City Secretary, is 811. Leave your lights on for just a second or two. Thank you. Mr. Warren. Council, any questions, comments for Mr. Warren? Seeing none, Chair will a motion to approve. So moved. So moved. Second. Motion to approve by Mr. McBurnett, second by Mr. Contreras. Council, please vote on approving item five, where are we? C, five C is in Charlie. Please vote. Unanimously approve. Please your legal lights on. Thank you. Moving on to item five D. Conduct a public hearing and consider an ordinance amending the comprehensive zoning ordinance and map as heretofore amended by revoking a special use permit for a cosmetology school and salon, ordinance number 2325, on property currently zoned as local office slash retail district, loaded at 928 South Cedar Ridge Drive. Mr. Warren. Thank you, Mayor, Council, and this is our final <laughs> item for, for planning for today. Uh, the request is to rescind the existing SUP for a cosmetology school and salon. Uh, we no longer have that land use uh, definition uh, today it would fit school, business, trade, or vocational. Uh, the existing zoning district for 928 South Cedar Ridge Drive is LOR, local, local office retail district. In this uh, zoning district, the use, school, business, trade, or vocational is permitted by right. Image on the left shows the aerial of the subject site. The image on the right shows the zoning of the property. 15 mailings were sent out. We had no responses in favor or in opposition. Staff recommends approval of the request, uh, as did uh, Planning and Zoning Commission, by a vote of five to zero. Thank you. City Council, any comments or questions? Seeing none, Chair will entertain a motion to approve. Motion to close the public hearing. 
I forgot that. Yeah. No, I said I gave a timestamp of eight eleven. We voted on closing the public hearing at eight eleven. Yeah. Oh, that. Where are we now? Oh, I'm getting it because it's like, okay. <laughs> These are all the same. They're all, the, yeah, so my mind is just like, do so this. Yes. Okay, all right. Okay, so we did not have a hearing on 5D, is it David? Correct. Okay, so opening the public hearing. Where was the time stamp for eight? Never mind. That, thank you very much. Okay, so we're opening the public hearing on item 5D. And the timestamp is 8.15. Any individuals who wish to speak in favor of this item, please come forward. Any individuals who wish to speak in opposition to this item, please come forward. Thank you very much. Seeing none, Chair will entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So move. Yep. Motion to approve the, to close the public hearing with Mr. McMurnett, seconded by Councilmember Cherry Brown. Please vote on closing the public hearing for item 5D. Unanimously approved. Timestamp 815. Any questions of Mr. Warren? Mr. Koontz. I'm in favor of this. I just had a quick question. So since the, the use, cosmetology school and salon, so that's no longer uh, a use that we have in our zoning ordinance. So that that doesn't make any difference that we're switching we're, we're just transferring it over to the the use that exists it's similar to it the new definition would include Move to uh, a comment was made by a citizen they could not hear you mr hager it's okay Does he, does he, does he want to repeat what he said? Could you repeat what you said, Mr. Hager, please? It was okay. <laughs> it was okay. I said that the, that the current definition includes the old definition as, as an educational institution, and therefore it'll be put on the books under its new title, not its old title, so it's fine. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Kuntz. You. Yes, sir. Move to approve. A motion to approve, and Mr. Kuntz. Second. Second of Mr. McBurnett. Please vote on approving item 5D. Unanimously approved. Thank you. Item 5E. Consider a resolution authorizing approval of incentive grants by the Duncanville Community Economic Development Corporation, the DCEDC, to Italy Family Pharmacy, Inc., not to exceed $9,800 for a building located at 102 East Daniel Dale Road, number 100, Duncanville, Texas, 75137. Mr. Brewer, the floor is yours, sir. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Um, this is Jeremiah Brewer, Economic Development Coordinator. Tonight before you is an application for incentives for Italy Family Pharmacy, located at 102 East Daniel Dale Road. Um, previously, DCDC approved a signage incentive in the amount of 6500 at their April 2023 board meeting, which the City Council approved in September of the same year. This application is for incentives for additional signage, which would be for the uh, compounding and equipment portion of the pharmacy, as well as the drive-through sign. The incentive application asks for $9,840.76, but the DCDC board approved, 9, 000, approved the incentive application up to $9,800, their clarification. And these are some current pictures from Italy Family Pharmacy. As you can see, there's the temporary uh, banner signs for where they're going to put up the sign for the compounding and then the drive through And then there's the current sign that DDC incentive was for. The proposed investment or the average of the four bids provided to the EDC was uh, $8,749 in 
and seven hundred seventy five cents. The DCAT appraised value is one million seven hundred eighty five thousand dollars. Not one million seven hundred eighty five thousand three hundred thirty dollars and at an estimated uh, hundred twenty five dollars per square foot in a roughly ten thousand square foot of retail building. Um, the estimated sales tax generated would be uh, uh, one million two hundred forty five thousand eight hundred seventy five dollars with the sales tax revenue that the city gets to twenty four thousand nine hundred and seventeen dollars and fifty cents. And I apologize, Council. The the bids are not in the. I don't see the bids attached in the packet, but I do have them here with me to distribute. Okay, Mr. Brewer, thank you. Any questions uh, from council members? Mr. Contreras. Just uh, briefly, um, and thank you for that presentation. Uh, do we know that the uh, total square footage of the two signs combined have been approved by the building inspection department uh, as to meet that criteria? Um, in the development agreements that will be uh, signed by the city manager, the DCDC board president, and then the incentive applicant winner, they will have to be a, uh, it's specified that the signs have to be a, uh, they have to be in conformance with all city ordinances and resolution. Thank you. Any other questions from city council? Chair, let a motion to approve. So moved. We have a motion to approve it, Mr. McBurnett, a second by Mr. Contreras. Council vote on approving item 5E. Unanimously approved. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are going to create <laughs> item 5F. And item 5F is from consent agenda item 4e and i will read that consider a resolution approving a license and use agreement with texas master naturalist indian trail chapter for activities at the charles f ladd nature preserve mr stevenson I have a prepared presentation, but as you're aware, uh, at our last council meeting, we briefed uh, you on this item. Uh, this item is essentially an opportunity to partner with the Master Naturalists in continuing their efforts at the Lad Nature Preserve uh, with all the good things they've done to date and continuing those projects into the future. So we have worked with our city attorney uh, on creating that agreement. And I think the one thing that has come up here in the last day or two is uh, some concerns about the insurance requirements that uh, they're all working through with our city attorney and their council as well. Uh, I know that uh, we ran short of time. That's why we asked what was normally to be on consent to move this here to the public forum. And I know that Mr. Coons, you asked for this. Uh, any other comments you'd like to make, sir? Yes, I'd like to kind of hear more about the, the issues, issues with the insurance requirements and, and what were some of those issues. City attorney may better be able to answer this question, but my understanding is that they don't have insurance as an uh, individual chapter. Uh, their insurance is through an overall umbrella of the Master Naturalist, not the Indian Trails chapter. So um, that is the issue. And there's also something about the indiv requiring individual insurance as well. Is that, is that correct, Mr. Hager? Uh, no, no, no. That's not Wrong. correct. The, yeah, my mic's on. Yeah. Uh, the, the issue was we normally, when we allow people to get on city property and do things, we normally require a minimum of a million dollars worth of insurance. So when I got on the, the Texas Master Naturalist Program and read the requirements, it said that they have a, a policy through Texas Wildlife Department and Texas A&M and that individual chapters are encouraged to get more coverage than is provided by the A&M Texas Naturalist Cons or the Department of Wildlife's policy that they're umbrellaed under. And so I wrote our standard requirement for insurance 
Ms. McCool told me yesterday they couldn't meet that requirement. I told her to then change the agreement to what you could agree to and then the council could determine from a policy standpoint what would be appropriate for the city of Duncanville. That was the issue on insurance. So, and we had that conversation yesterday. Well, th thank you for that. Mm -hmm. a and uh, you know, as we move forward in trying to, to build these relationships with these partners and trying to encourage these relationships with these partners and, and just making sure that, um, you know, we're, we're not discouraging them in any way. A and I, I believe that the, the project chair, uh, Robbie Robbins, is here uh, from the Texas Master Naturalists, if it'd be okay if uh, we, we could hear from him as far as what they do and the services they provide and what their partnerships and agreements with cities normally look like, if we could hear from him. Certainly, Mr. Roberts. Okay. Mr. Yeah, if you're at requesting, sure, Mr. Roberts. And just so we have it for the record, if you could state your name and address, please. Uh, yeah. My name is Robbie Robbins, uh, address 343 Shorewood Drive, Duncanville 75116. Uh, uh, could, uh, yeah, so, so could you just tell us, you know, so what, what exactly do the Texas Master Naturalists do? Right, so we're a, a core of trained volunteers who provide um, environmental resource management uh, as well as education to the general public about um, nature-related items. Um, so we do, we do management of the properties so we have a couple of different properties that we work on mockingbird nature preserve in midlothian uh, there's kachina prairie in ennis bardwell lake in waxahachie um, are just some examples of some of the uh, places where we do the resource management out there um, as far as what we have going on with them as far as an agreement between cities um, there is not a precedent for that that has been set by our chapter. We don't have an agreement with Midlothian, with Waxahachie, or Ennis. Um, none of them have, have deemed it necessary to do so. Uh, so we don't have any kind of standing agreement. I did find an example of one between the city of... Um, there is an example between one city and the uh, Blackland Prairie chapter um, the city of Frisco. It's not a, it's not quite as legally, it's, it's not written in like legal jargon. It's a letter agreement um, just stating, you know, we do these kind of management practices with invasive removal and all this kind of um, stuff that's beneficial for the environment. And then also a list of things that we would be not permitted to do or would need to seek additional approval to do. Thank you. So, and, and I'm in favor of this and I'm, um, you know, in favor of hearing back and seeing what uh, w what they find agreeable, but I, I guess you know, I'm trying to figure out because my understanding is that the their arrangements and partnerships with other cities are not as legally formal, <laughs> right? And, uh, yeah. and and why it's necessary uh, for the city of Duncanville to have such a um, again just a formal legal agreement because it. Already, it's kind of creating a hindrance to them moving forward and doing what, what they're doing in every other city around us. So I'm just trying to understand what the fear or concern is um, with, you know, with this allowing them to do what they do. And, and if such an agreement is necessary. <laughs> Mr. Hager, that is a question for our city attorney. Well, my job is to protect the city. And when people are on our property doing things, I have a legal obligation to give you my best advice. I gave you my best advice. Uh, can we hear from the parks director again? Uh, so have we reached out to other cities that have these you know, partnerships with the master naturalists and see We're, if they've had any any issues with you know with the with the arrangements that they have have they had any 
issues with the, the naturalists, any liability liability issues, any issues with them uh, doing things that the cities realize, oh, maybe we shouldn't have allowed them to do that. Um, any issues whatsoever? I'm not aware of any issues, and I have not reached out to any city specifically to this um, it's this case. Um, I will say that we have similar type of agreements with like the youth sports association to come and use our ball fields and use our parks, um, but that we require them to have certain levels of insurance. So that's probably the, the best comparison I can make to something that we have currently in place with organized groups using our facilities. Uh, same with our um, any of our instructors uh, that use our parks uh, or our facilities. We all requ we require insurance for all of those folks as well. Thank you, and I and I understand that kind of looking at um, with arrangements that we have, but you know this is kind of incomparable to uh, organized sports, and so there's you know it's quite a bit different. So again, I, I'm I'm in favor of this. It looks like it's going to have to come back to us anyways. Uh, we're not going to be able to make any decision tonight if, if, if we're having to review I, the language. I spoke again. with Miss McCool yesterday, who is the president of the chapter, who is a lawyer. And I encouraged her to mark up this agreement any way she thought her group saw fit for us to get down the road, because I realize that this is important to the community. And I feel like I'm being held defensive for looking after your interest of the city. And I, I, that's not what I'm doing. I'm trying, when I was asked to create an agreement, my job is to create the best agreement I can to protect the city. Now, if this council wants less of an agreement, that's fine, <clears throat> but that's your choice. So I'm gonna give you my best advice, and I've told you all before, you're free to ignore it. And I don't mean that in the sense that you're not fulfilling your fiduciary duty to your community. But when you ask me to do something, I'm gonna give you my best work. I, I would hope you would expect that. If you want less of an agreement, that's fine. I encouraged Ms. Irwin um, McCool yesterday to mark that agreement up any way she wanted and I would present both to you and the council could decide what they wanted to do. I'm not, I don't think anyone from my office is being obstructionist. I don't think it's, we don't want them there. But I have certain obligation when you expect things from me to give you my very best advice. And if it's more than they're willing to do and you're willing to accept less, that's, that's fine, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But I don't want someone coming back here five years from now and saying, why did you let them sign that? I don't, you don't have to ask my permission to sign anything. So I, I, I wanna make sure everybody understands that when the council asked me to do something, my job is to give you my very best work. And if you want something less than that in order to accommodate a citizen, a volunteer group, please do so. I appreciate that. So, uh, you know, this, this is still on our agenda uh, for an approval as a consent item. It's still there. And so, uh, no, like it's, it it's on like our agenda. Comments, it's so. our agenda now as an item for individual right. consideration. Right, right, So it's still so it's still an, an item for individual yeah. consideration only. Yeah. Right. So um, I did it looks like a, there's some other comments. So yes, I will yeah, take so, care of those, yeah. Mr. Coons. Yeah. Thank you very much. No, you're no done I'm with saying your so. Questions. I, yeah, so I have other comments, but I'm going to allow other people to speak. Is what I'm saying. All right, Mr. Contreras. Uh, <clears throat> question for Mr. Hager. Um, I understand. Um, the approach of protecting us, but I do want to ask the question about whether um, there's any form or fashion of a waiver that could be signed that would protect us. Uh, I think I think liability waivers are worthless because you only waive what you know about. So if you get out there and find something you don't know about and get hurt, the waiver's no good. So. We have insurance. It's a park for, for the purposes of immunity, okay? So we're pretty protected, but they're not. Their insurance, our insurance may not protect them, so I need to make sure when they're on our property that they have insurance to protect the people that volunteer to come out there. That's all, that's what I ask for. If, if they don't have their own policy and they only want to use the state policy, 
I'm fine with that. I told Ms. McCool that yesterday, just I asked her to change. So she sent over a letter agreement today at 3.30. I'm sorry, I haven't read it yet. I was actually doing some other work and then I found out when I got here that she had sent that. So, I mean, I don't have any problem with you approving it. If you, I don't know if you've seen the letter agreement from Ms. McCool. It, it, it's basically a skeleton of what my agreement was to her. It says that they're gonna get on the property and they're gonna do these things and they'll have insurance through the state and they're gonna have some activities. I mean, there, there are proposed activities out there. I'll, I'll, I'll be the first person. I don't know everything that they do. So when someone says they're gonna have activities on our property, I get a little concerned uh, what that might be. Not that they would do something inappropriate, but you know, if there's more people out there, uh, some, you know, like I said, my job is to protect the city. It's their job to promote their, and so we'll find a common ground. So I don't think Thank it's you. insurmountable. Um, and you know, it was just the last meeting where we were asked to do this. I don't think two weeks is too long, but that's up to you all too. Okay, thank you. Um, I do want to suggest that until we get to look at that letter uh, that was sent over to your office, I don't know how we can move forward tonight with this. Thank you. I will take a moment to say that I am in full agreement with our city attorney in terms of his obligation and duty to protect this city. And the manner in which this agreement has presented to us today is legally sufficient. And irregardless of what other cities do, it is not his job to look at what other cities do, nor does our job to think about making things easier and taking the road of least lesser resistance. This is a protected item for the city. There's a major portion of our city that has been dedicated to this land. And we believe, I believe, maybe no other person does on this dais, I believe our city attorney is doing everything in his contract and responsibility to this city to protect us to the nth degree and to ensure <clears throat> that any contingency that may arise is gonna be fully covered and properly covered in legally sufficient grounds. So I know that there has been a request to think about holding off on this. I don't personally agree with that, but. Uh, I think that we have a legally sufficient contract before us to move forward or an agreement as it may be construed in terms of whatever legal language, but uh, it's open to any further discussion. And I see Mr. Koontz would like to continue, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so, you know, Mr. Attorney, so hopefully I, I apologize if, uh, if you feel any kind of personal attacks here. Th this isn't about um. any attacks on the city attorney. Um, so I, I take offense at the fact that um, that I'm being accused of uh, of that, but uh, I agree with Mr. Contreras. It doesn't look like that we'll be able to move forward uh, this evening on this. I'd like to see the the, the marked up uh, version of this that we get back from Miss um, McCool, and, and then maybe in the meantime determine whether or not th this is even necessary. Um, and you know, City Manager, if if we could look, uh, maybe call some other cities that do have an arrangement with the naturalists and uh, that's a little out of order mr Kuntz. And, we, and, we, and we need to decide in terms of a request has been made maybe to table this well, so any so, any direction to the city meantime. manager would be subsequent to a, a request and to motion to table okay, well something's got to happen in the meantime so i'm just saying uh if we could just call up a couple of these other cities and their parks departments and maybe see um what those arrangements are like and, and see if uh, that they believe that such an agreement is necessary. Is there a motion and to in table? In the meantime, I would like to move to table this. Okay, we have a so motion to second. table this item. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion to table by Mr. Kuntz. We have a second by Mr. McBurnett. Please vote on tabling this item. If you vote in favor, it is tabled. If you vote in opposition, it is not tabled. Please vote. Uh, Mayor, I'd, yes. I'd still like to say I'd like, I'd like to see it at the next meeting as well. Thank you. Well, I took their acceptance of that as, as part of your second. Yes. Okay. So please vote in favor or in opposition to tabling this item. 
and the vote is five to one with myself dissenting uh, the motion to table. Thank you. And city manager uh, at direction of the city council, uh, the, uh, it was the only body in the city able to give you direction. Uh, there is a request been made to look at similar agreements or look at other cities to see what they look like and to bring that information back to us and so that we can understand fully what other cities are doing. And I think that the legal sufficient grounds would also be something that would be taken under consideration by our city attorney and also to find out um, that's basically how other things are being done. And also, I would add, to make uh, public the letter that has been sent to Mr. DeHager by the Master Naturalist Organization in terms of what, anything that's been marked up or changed. So thank you very much, Mr. City, City Manager, for that consideration and direction that we are giving tonight. Thank you. We are now moving on to we are taking item 4I from the consent agenda, creating it as item 5G for items for individual consideration. Consider resolution authorizing an amendment to Professional Services Agreement 24-0013 with Alliance Geotechnical Group Incorporated for geotechnical engineering and materials testing services through May 1st of 2028 and a total contract amount not exceeding $300,000 subject to City Council appropriation. Uh, turning it over to Interim Public to Work Director, Ms. Colton. The floor is yours. Honorable Mayor, distinguished members of the Duncanville City Council, I'm Jacqueline Colton, the Interim Director of Public Works, and I am here to talk with you on tonight about the Alliance Geotechnical Group Contract Amendment. It originally was on the consent agenda and it has been moved to items for individual consideration. Okay, before uh, we, we did prepare a presentation for tonight, um, Councilwoman Gooden and, and Mayor, um, before I get into that presentation, I guess, are there particular questions that, that you have for me? Um, personally, I didn't have any questions. Councilwoman Gooden? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Colton. So in reviewing the item, I noticed um, that it went from 45,000 to 300,000. That's what immediately caught my eye. Um, and then I started reading and it said something about the services. So it was originally put out as an RFQ. So I, I'm kind of asking for education okay. on um, RFQ versus RFP. Can we do an increase of this type of services and its amount under an RFQ, would it not need to go under RFP? And when I say RFP, I mean request for proposals. That's from years ago, though. I don't know if it's changed since then. Uh, yes, so. and I'm going to invite um, our purchasing officer, Mr. Elton Brock, to join me um, at the podium since your question is more of a contractual one. Mr. Brock, do you understand the question? Uh, or does it need to be repeated? Could you repeat that? Yes, because yes. I saw that you were coming in as it was being asked. Okay. Yes, Please. I'm asking for education um, because I noticed the amount and I was saying that that's what originally caught my eye from 45000 to 300000 And I started to review it and I want to know can we do an increase of that amount under an RFQ, which request for qualification means to me we're putting out an advertisement to receive qualifications for services. 
professional services. And why wouldn't this be a request for proposal? That was my term for an RFP. Has it changed, and what is the difference, and can we do that? Yes, it has changed. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the procurement of professional services is governed by Texas Government Code 2254, the Professional Services Procurement Act. That's uh, passed probably 12 years ago now. And so uh, it, it's, it's used to procure professional services in a way that uh, we don't know the price uh, to begin with. So these, this, this procurement that was done, I think it was in 2023, um, it was in 2023, there was an RFQ, uh, was brought, back, brought to this council. Um, and normally when cities bring RFQs, they either do them one at a time or they do a mass, you know, like uh, Jackie did. Uh, so when they do the mass, they usually bring an amount of money they're gonna spend over a period of years with those firms. That wasn't done with this council at the time because I, I don't know why it wasn't done that way. But either or, at this point, what they, they're able to do under the law is that all these firms that the council approved to use, they're able to use and approve those up to $50,000. When they get over $50,000, they have to come to the governing body to be approved. Right, I understand the threshold of um, $50,000. Yes. but. Uh, part yeah. of the part of the issue is it's an engineering firm, right? And you cannot get proposals uh, or bid engineering services. Right. You can only let a contract for engineer, engineering services based on their qualifications. And so we brought before before your tenure on the council, we brought a number of engineering contracts to the council to approve. Uh, various firms to perform various services and then there were work orders given off the award so we had a geotech we had someone that would work with water we had someone work with streets uh, for the various engineering services we got their qualifications and we can use any of those engineering firms to do work for us based off a work order as we need them so what Jackie's now done because we like to get that pricing locked in on today's price, she went back and averaged out basically how much time those geotech people have performed services over the last few years, and then she takes that times this rate that we're getting to give you a maximum amount for through 2028. And that's the 300,000? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So that's for four or five years based on past experience with what our geotech instead of, so we have qualified geotech people, we're authorizing the money to spend if we need it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brock. Thank you, City Attorney. Any other questions? Chair Lantana, motion to approve. This so was, moved. Okay, this is Mr. Approved. Motion second. approved by Mr. McBurnett, second by Mr. Kuntz. And just for the record, we are now voting on item 5G, which used to be I, I'm sorry, yeah, used to be item 4I from consent. It is now individual consideration item 5G. Please vote. Unanimously approved. Thank you. Thank you. We are now creating item 5H from item 4J of the consent agenda. And this is item 5H now for, and items for individual consideration. Consider resolution awarding a bid and authorizing a cooperative purchase agreement with Silsby Ford to purchase six Ford Explorers through Texas Procurement and Support Services, contract 070-M1 in the expenditure amount of $227,996.94. And Mr. Brock, sir. Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, I'm glad to be here to talk just a little bit about the purchase of these vehicles. It's been a long time coming for the police department, and, uh, and I'm glad to help make that happen. Uh, the purchase of these vehicles um, is, is, is at a really great price you know, through the state of Texas contract. If you try to buy that vehicle locally today, it's around forty-seven to fifty thousand dollars. So it is a really good price. And not only we are able to secure those vehicles uh, at that price, 
the only reason that we were able to do that is because these vehicles were placed on order by another state agency and those vehicles were not going to be able to be taken because of some some reason they couldn't take them we just happened to be at the right time at the right place to ask the question could we take them so we were able to take them and uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, we got that in but it, we're saving around a hundred thousand dollars on the price of those vehicles uh, that would normally cost us if we bought them locally and not only that when i've talked to the police chief uh, there is a considerable amount of maintenance that's going on with the current CID vehicles, so uh, we'd be able to save on that as well. And the delivery on these? Uh, delivery, I believe, is in September. Uh, the vehicles are on order, so that order hadn't stopped, so we're going to be able to get them very, very quickly. And, and that's a full outfitting, ready to hit the road in September? Re ready to hit the, uh, I believe they're going to need to get the lights put on them, is what I understand, and the that's radio. Ready to go into service. Ready to go into September. Service. And those, those will get the um, uh, outfitted locally. Uh, right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, well, that's good. Look at your start. Thank you. Um, so I guess we can say that this is along the lines of helping re me refresh my memory. I am in favor of this item. Yes. I just want to ask a couple questions. All right. I know at one time we were considering um, a leasing agency. I won't, I will refrain from using the name. We were re considering a leasing agency and we approved it. How is it now that we have money available um, for the purchase of vehicles and an available budget of 739 versus just a few months ago um, we were considering doing a leasing agent because of the replacement needs and the um, repair needs and things like that. So, yes, I, I fully understand that question. Um, I, I wasn't, um, you know, in in favor of or in a favor against uh, the leasing agreement. But when you look at the holistic part of the lease agreement to any government organization. You're paying for that either way you are, and it was a very high cost to the city of Duncanville. And so uh, I believe by purchasing these vehicles and allowing our uh, staff to maintain them uh, that you're going to get more bang for the buck at the end of the day. And uh, it's just been my experience by doing so. Okay. I'm not quite sure if that kind of answered my question. Mr. City Manager, does... Do you understand the question? I, I do, Council Member. Uh, thank you. And, and actually, the interim police chief might be able to help out here a little bit because I believe, if I'm not mistaken, these are undercover vehicles. Yes, they're, they're uh, undercover vehicles. <coughs> and so there was, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I know that there was previously a conversation, and, and I think there was, um, from what I understand from previous conversations that we've had, that uh, the leasing arrangement may not work for these undercover vehicles. Is that correct? So we have two okay. that were undercover. Now, these vehicles as well aren't marked. Uh, they're for our detectives. Um, now, there's two, our narcotics units, uh, that have their own vehicles too. And I think that's a separate uh, from this. I'm sorry, there's communication going on I don't hear. I'm sorry, Mayor. Uh, I mean, and it might be more for Mr. Jackson and Mr. Miss Ote as well, but in this part of the vehicle replacement plan. Well, there's another comment in terms of what Ms. Gooden said at our prior approval of a lease agreement, and I recall very clearly that the <coughs> interim city manager at the time examined that leasing agreement and found significant issues in terms of it being to the disadvantage of the city of Duncanville. And that way, it was not really approved. It was it was discontinued at that moment, and that was looking it through and understanding not only the the cash flows of it, but there were certain clauses in that agreement that were not to our advantage as a city, and so that was completely set aside at that point, and we were moving forward with now procurement and looking at the remainder of the dollars available for these. Uh, so that's it's just one sidebar in terms of your consider and your question has great merit in terms of putting this forward as well uh, but understanding in terms of looking at these six in terms of the necessity and looking at the mileage and the, and the expenses oh, and I looked at of the vehicles that are being replaced only two are going to be auctioned off which means four of them are in such bad shape they're not even worth a dollar 
and one of them is going to be the anticipated auction amount is going to be fifteen hundred dollars, uh, which means what? This it's, it's almost scrap in terms of the the capability of these of these vehicles that we're replacing. They're in such bad shape; they're not going to be worth much in terms of maybe cannibalization for parts. Somebody might buy it for part it out, but in terms of putting it on the road for service, if it's going to be auctioned off for a thousand dollars, what's it really worth of a vehicle that could be? You know, we're looking at 47, 48, could be 65,000, depending on the, the procurement actions of Mr. Brock and so forth. So looking at this in terms of the, the monetary amount, yes, there's a sticker shock always when we go through this. But in understanding how we got to this point, the necessity, the urgency that these vehicles are available, that we do know that sometimes it takes 12 to 18 months to be able to buy, purchase a vehicle, get it outfitted and put it in service. Here we have a great advantage to us for about $230,000 to put these on the road and be able to well service our, our, our police department. So I just wanted to add that in terms of putting this into, into perspective. Yes, well, thank you. Um, I do understand the urgency and like I said, I'm in favor of this item. I think it is a great opportunity um, that we probably won't get in the future because of the price that's attached to the vehicles, great price. My question is available budget of $739,000 was that the case at the time we considered the leasing agreement? And um, what were the indicators that made us consider the leasing agreement? Does that make sense? Does, because if we had funding, why were we considering the leasing agreement pretty much? So I, didn't, I wasn't involved in the discussions with the leasing agreement for the overall city. Um, leasing agreement. Um, our narcotics unit, um, they had their own leasing agreement that we're moving away from because it went up 300%. Um, as far as the funds, uh, we contribute to a vehicle replacement fund and these vehicles were due to be replaced in FY22. As far as where the money is coming from at this point, that I can't answer. Thank you. Ms. Oh, okay, here we go. The guru, Ms. Ote, how are you? My apologies. Um, so the leasing agreement really has, does not come into play at this at all. What we Thank appropriated you. was based on what we were assuming if we went down that road, but obviously we did not. So we had made you know, so much appropriation based on our needs. So this agenda item assumes um, a budget amendment that's coming to you before you, hopefully by the next meeting. Um, this would have been in conjunction with our discussion on the briefing with the brush truck that we're having later, talking about our continued needs in the fleet replacement fund. Mm -hmm. We wanted to brief you before um, we brought that to you. So, but again, given the urgency of getting this um, item pushed through, um, it was on consent for this meeting. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. I move to approve. Okay, Second. Uh, any other? Okay. Thank you very much. Motion to approve by Councilmember Gooden. Second by Mr. Mac Burnett. Please vote. Unanimously approved. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor, uh, Mr. Contreras yes, actually sir. seconded that. Um, who? What? Mr. Contreras actually was oh, the second. I'm sorry. I uh, finally <laughs> beat Mr. Mac Burnett to the button. Okay, thank you. Okay, that concludes the items for individual consideration. And as we previously determined, we are going to go to the staff and board reports. And then we are going to go to briefings and presentations. to where I need to go here. Okay. So the first item for staff and board reports. Um, let, me, let me ask this question, uh, Mr. City Manager. Are any of these staff and board reports of substance that need to be taken at this time or can they be deferred to a later date? We can take them now. I'm just asking if, you know, since we're watching, this is, 
we have turned things over in order to accommodate original uh, time schedule. Right. But we can certainly go through this. Uh, I'm in no pressure to say we need to leave it any time. But if everybody's ready and prepared to do this and it's essential, then we need to go ahead and do these. What, what I would just say, Mayor, and thank you for the question. The, the first relates to vacancies on our boards and commissions, so that would really be a council decision. The uh, 6B, 6C, I think we need to have a discussion with council to get some direction. And then 6D would be your monthly financial report. So, again, that would be up to the council. Okay. Based on the city manager's inputs, I would, I'm thinking that we probably ought to take all five, all, what do we have? All four, all four of these not delay any of them okay let's go uh, <clears throat> excuse me revere current boards and vacancy commission vacancies and the city secretary okay thank you mayor and I have included that now we have 18 vacancies on all of, of our boards that's not including the nine that are on the multicultural commission that currently only has two members and does not meet we are advertising now in the May newsletter. We're advertising and we'll begin advertising on the LED signs, all of this in May, as well as sending out incumbent letters for um, current terms that are expiring in August of 2024. Okay. And I'll take any questions. Yeah, Mr. McBurnett. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Ms. Taylor, do you know if there's any outstanding applications or that have been put in? Currently, uh, I have three applications. Can, can you tell us what groups are for? I have an application for Keep Duncanville Beautiful. I have one for um, TIFF Board, and I have one that is has requested three different boards, but they two of the boards have a have a vacancy and one does not that they've chosen they've chosen three boards so I have three applications on file currently I appreciate your comment and I think there's probably been some transition and and, and stuff city manager that that I know for instance um, I, I had a gentleman that put in for the audit committee and actually attended the audit committee meeting and I, I know he submitted one in and and I don't and I, that one, that is, he did send it in, and at the time he sent it in, I sent it out to everyone that was the council to review his application for audit committee, because he came in in early January, I believe. Okay. And, okay. And, and I appreciate that. I just, to me, that would be one that would be outstanding or considered yes. as outstanding. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And also we're doing also working on along with Alex on an online application to make it easier for people to apply for a position so they don't have to send in a paper application that we're working on getting where you can just uh, submit an application online. Okay, Mr. Contreras. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, just food for thought for maybe something down the road. A number of years ago, um, I would say back to 2013 or 14, uh, we had a similar problem where board membership was low and the city manager at that time um, put together a pretty well planned uh, for lack of a better term a boards and commission fair and we had board members set up booths at the senior center and invited the public in it was well attended it's just food for thought to try to get a jump on all the vacancies thank you that's a good thought of um, I know that the events for the august 7th and 8th for park was it dark in the park i don't know if anything could be done that quickly but it might be a venue for putting up some some information for that it's right around the corner i mean it's pretty pretty fast but it's, it's a good suggestion so mr city manager if possible uh, without putting too much pressure on staff it, it's something to consider okay um see secretary the this data compiled in this manner was superb okay. to be able to see 
as you highlight, I printed it off in black and white to save my ink at my printer. But, <laughs> <laughs> but to see how it's is highlighted in terms of where the reds are mm -hmm. and understanding how this is, this is a superb piece of information for, for historical record going back in, in terms of what, even what Mr. Contreras said, this is where we stand today, 18 vacancies in yeah. terms of what we have for all of this. So thank you for compiling all this. I imagine you and maybe Karen put it together or maybe just you solo, I don't know. Uh, but we appreciate it. I thank you. personally appreciate this data. It's very, very informational and educational. Thank you. Any other information or questions for City Secretary on this item? Okay. The next one we have is item 6B, Council Briefing on Hotel Occupancy and Tax Expenditure Process. Council, um, good evening. I want to come down here so that I could uh, be with Angela and, and talk to you and, and see all of you, <clears throat> excuse me, um, relative to our hot tax funds, our hotel occupancy tax funds. I, I provided in the staff report, uh, you have that information in front of you, the city of Duncanville passed uh, the hot tax ordinance uh, back in 1974 with a 3% uh, rate, occupancy tax rate. In 1983, they increased it to 5%, and in 1988, increased it to 7%. Um, mind you, the um, Texas law will allow you to go up to 9%. Um, I bring this before you because what's happened recently is uh, Ms. Owens came to me not too long ago relative to some events. You know that we're working on some signature events to really promote the city of Duncanville. And we have some incredible opportunity to use hot tax funds to help support those events. A perfect example was last December, the drone show at the Christmas parade. What I have not been able to find is a clear policy that outlines who is authorized to spend what at what level. There's a reference, what I would say uh, a very vague reference, uh, in the application for hot tax funds application to a $3,000 limit that can be approved by uh, the director, in, in this case uh, the economic development director, and obviously that position is vacant. However, upon further inquiries I dug into that, I cannot really find a policy that goes along with that. The reference was to the general procurement policy operational of the general funds. So after conversation with our uh, DCEDC and, and Ms. Owens, I would like to propose that we put together a policy and bring it back for your consideration to really outline how we're going to authorize the use of these funds. Um, the suggestion is that uh, pursuant to Texas law, Chapter 351-101C, that you actually delegate the uh, Duncanville Community Economic Development Corporation is the administering entity of hot tax funds for expenditures up to $50,000 uh, reimbursable. And then what we would do is we would have a policy with them, and we have talked with the DCEDC about this, where $3,000 could be approved by the up to $3,000 by uh, the Economic Development Director, which would make Angela's life easier when she's coordinating with uh, some of these events, and then allow the DCEDC to um, authorize the expenditures up to 50000 and then anything 50000 or above would actually have to come to council. So not looking for you to take action this evening necessarily, but just wanted to have a general conversation. This would have been a briefing, but given the number of briefings, uh, we didn't have time for that. So just wanted to open a dialogue with you to see, I guess, two questions is, is, is the proposed policy something that uh, you would entertain? And then the, the second, I think, is probably a, maybe a little bit weightier conversation is, do you have any interest in exploring that increase of the occupancy tax up to the 9% that's authorized by Texas law that would allow us additional funding for additional signature events? Two thoughts uh, to address what you just said. I think that what you're proposing in terms of the DCEDC to fund those amounts up to $50,000 without coming to council would streamline the process. And looking at it today, are we encumbered by that process? Is it more difficult for the DC, DC, DC to do their job? And it's a matter of trust. And if we, as a council, appoint those individuals to the DCEDC, looking at it is the only one that we have, it's the only board that we have in terms of a corporate board of directors that is running a corporation and knowing that we look at the qualifications so that they fill up specific 
qualifier for serving on the DCEDC, I would think that that trust that we have for those individuals, I would believe if I would be in favor of allowing that trust to or to you know, empower the DCEDC to do their job for knowing that we would trust those individuals. <clears throat> Anything that the city manager certainly has to come to get involved in that procurement process and then putting that trust in the city manager's seat saying DCEDC has, has been empowered, city manager has been empowered, let's go ahead and do the 50,000 unless city DCEDC or city manager says this needs to come before council. So I would see that as streamlining, facilitating the process. The second thing in terms of raising it to 9%, where you've, you have shown that the rest of the cities in the Best Southwest Partnership are at seven, that might be something to discuss among your peers with the city managers. Uh, to say, we as a city, all cities right now are under great scrutiny in terms of the financial processes, the fiduciary responsibilities. I think there would be, it should be a discussion with the hotel managers as well uh, to see what they would think in terms of what the impact is gonna be. Because if people start looking at their bills and saying, well, they're charging me 9% when I go to Duncanville, but I can get in a hotel for 7% somewhere else in the same locale, it could be to our detriment. So this is, it's a great item to put on the topic. I think it has some discussion uh, to, to facilitate that and see how it looks and then come back to us and, and let us know what, what kind of information you find. Uh, Mr. Contreras. Uh, I just want to agree with you. Um, I was going to make the same uh, uh, suggestion that we would get feedback from our we're a small town so we're close with our hotel owners and managers so i think that's a great idea to uh, before we'd ever consider that going forward that we pull them into the conversation thank you and i think to be fair to say the timeline is yours absolutely the yeah. the other thing uh, if i could just add real quick um the conversation that we have with the dcedc that's not i don't believe the customary practice is uh, that the policy would actually require the DCEDC to hold a public hearing uh, for those amounts when they get requested so that they would have the opportunity to hear public input. And that recently happened, and I think that went very well, and, and the DCEDC board actually was able to weigh into those comments into their consideration uh, as part of that policy. And then the other thing I was just going to say is uh, Ms. Owens, as you know, works very closely with our hotels, has actually been working on many, many different events with our local hotels. So you're comfortable in having that conversation and then we can come back for that portion of it at a later date, so. Okay, yeah. any other, yes, uh, Mr. Kuntz. Thank you, Mayor. Well, what's, I don't know, I guess currently and then under this potentially new policy would be the arrangement for, I'm thinking about the Arts Commission, but if you know other boards or commissions wanted to use, you know, saw a use for you know, the hot fund, would they have to Go to the DCEDC yes. as well? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other inputs for Mr. Finch? All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Going on to item 6D, I received the monthly financial report oh, as of February 20th. If I could have one more. There should be one right above that. It's real property. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, C. Council Thanks. briefing on an opportunity to collaborate with the Duncanville Community Economic Development Corporation on the development of parcels currently off the tax rolls and owned by the city of Duncanville. Um, I think, would you mind taking care of that? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor and Council. Mayor and Council, I've, I've had uh, some conversations with you, uh, primarily individually, about the real property that is owned by the city of Duncanville that's off the tax rolls. I think it's probably just a title slide, David. Um, there's about currently $5.4 million that's off the tax rolls uh, that is owned currently by the city of Duncanville. And we've had a conversation, uh, Chairman Govan is here, we've had a, mo a conversation at the most recent DCEDC meeting about really the DCEDC partnering with City Council to develop those parcels, put some of those parcels back on the tax rolls and ways that we can really make this a win-win situation with the DCEDC supporting the City of Duncanville's facilities uh, and operational cost is as allowed by the bylaws of the DCEDC. And so um, the, the, really the idea here is to bring forward, and again, this would have been a briefing uh, conversation, but to bring forward 
a policy, an agreement that the city council could consider uh, going into an agreement with the DCEDC that the city would sell land to the DCEDC, uh, land that the city wants developed by an independent foundation, which in this particular case would be the DCEDC. The DCEDC would then partner with developers to actually uh, bring forward those proposals, work on that, uh, and then the DCEDC could either sell the land to those developers or even sell or, or actually even own parts of those projects um, as it was with a recent conversation. Um, we do have an example of one of those particular properties where we have a developer interested in moving forward immediately. It might be a good case study, but uh, without us having a policy or an agreement in place, it would certainly help us make sure that we're following the council's direction if we had some sort of policy that we brought back to you uh, with regard to that effort. So, so I, I think what you're proposing is inventive and creative and is necessary with that $5.4 million sitting idle. You know, it, all it is is a number on a piece of paper. It goes nowhere. But question, would probably could have thought, should have thought of this question when we did it, something even in the last city council meeting. The movement of the property or the sale of the property from the city of Duncanville to the EDC, at that moment, does it go on the tax rolls or does it not go on the tax rolls until a outside developer purchases the property from the EDC? Fair question, Mayor. And, and that's where we have to further develop the policy a little bit more with the city attorney. It's my understanding that the sale would actually take effect uh, when that agreement takes place. The DCEDC would then be the titled owner, but the DCEDC is a not-for-profit organization. So the it would not be encumbered by property tax, by ad bad right. norm, because it's nonprofit. So in answer to my question, it would only come on the tax rolls when that property is conveyed by sale to a developer, right. from the EDC to a, to a, right. to a developer. Right. Okay, right. good. Right. Great right. answer. Right. Got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Contreras. Uh, just a um, note, um, I thought I knew every street in Duncanville, but I had to look up 1300 Woodlands Lane. Uh, and uh, uh, for those of you that didn't look it up or didn't know it was there, it, uh, for the folks that got recognized tonight and some other folks in the back, it used to be a drive-in uh, drive movie theater there. Still some of the posts laying out there and some of the concrete for that. Um, so that's 17 acres of land that would or would not have access off of, I'm just curious about this, off of uh, the service road on 67. It does have access? Okay, all right. That would be a, a good one I think somebody might want. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Mr. McBurnett, are, are you done with Mr. Contreras? I want to make sure, you know, Mr. McBurnett. Thank you, Mayor. And, and just to make a comment, I, I really appreciate this being done because we do want our, e, our EDC to be flexible and, and being able to turn corners that the city can't do. So highly supportive of this effort. Okay. I think you Got it. Okay. understand Thanks. where we're at. Mr. Govan, as chairman of the board of the EDC, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Pat. Do you have any comments? No, I'm good. Thank All you. right. Thank you. Okay, now item 6D, receive the monthly financial report as of February 29th of 2024. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So the monthly financial report as of the end of February. February would be the fifth month of our fiscal year, so that equates to a benchmark about 41.67% of the budget year has gone by. Um, so looking at all funds here, all funds revenue, we have collected uh, 40 million um, year to date. Our property tax is currently at 91% of its total budget. Um, we have received uh, 1.5 million year to date in interest income. Um, again, that benchmark that we uh, target is 41%, but our actual revenue um, year to date is 48%. On the expense side, we have uh, spent 32.6 million to date. Um, actual expenses are at 30% currently. And the month of February is when we make the first uh, annual uh, debt payment. So it includes the debt payment. 
Well, if I could interrupt here, just sure. stay on that. I'm looking at that year to date interest income of 1.6 million. At our last city council meeting, we found that there were some of that interest <coughs> income was actually li liquid, and we used some of that liquidity in terms of use for the city. So it, what we're looking at in terms of 1.6 million, has it been decremented by the interest income we used in liquidity for the last city council meeting, or is that where it stands? This is what snapshot? we have accounted for as interest that we have received and put on okay, the books. Okay, so the interest income that we used for that purpose last time has been included in the 1.6. We're actually at 1.6. Yeah, that's what we've actually received. We haven't, you know, appropriated that, you know, as right. in revenue, you know, to offset any additional costs, it, but it's, it's what we've accurate, actually. It's an accurate balance. Yes. Okay, thank you. Please excuse me. Thank you. Continue. Uh, so property tax, again, that's 50% of our general fund revenue. We've received 2.2 2 million in the month of February. Again, that's at 91%. Uh, sales tax, um, that, this would be the third month in the uh, fiscal year to receive a uh, sales tax. Um, we are uh, showing a negative 4.37% over this time last year. Um, state comptroller's office does do periodic audit um, collections, and so unfortunately we had to give back some money, so um, they had audited our um, account, and so we had to refund 142000 so that is the main driver of why that dip of negative 4.37 percent but since this is the third month um, the benchmarks at 25 percent um, since we collect two months behind um, and actually what we've received we're at 23 percent so we're not lagging too far what we budgeted so far and looking at the best southwest we weren't the only ones um, that had uh, had some audit collections there and had, had refunds so this is the uh, through December, what the, the sales tax looks like in the Best Southwest. So general fund, again, 41% is that benchmark. We have actually received 67%. Um, One million of interest has been uh, accounted for in the general fund. Um, our charges for service category is about 105% um, of the budget, so that's primarily EMS collections are trending um, ahead um, from what we budgeted. On the expense side, um, we have spent 13 million, that's 10 and a half payrolls. Um, we've actually expended 25%. And to give you that table view so you can see how it, you know, it all breaks down, um, again, we're, we're right on, um, right, right where we need to be with salary and benefits, we're, we're, we're trending well there, um, and on the other areas, we are trending a little behind. But overall, 34% is what we have spent. And just showing you fund balance, again, on, on audited fund balance, you can see how um, we are doing at this point in the year. Again, our revenues are heavier than our expenses at this point because we received most of our revenue in, early on in the fiscal year. Going to the utility fund, um, we collect one month behind, so our revenue collected year to date, 7.2 million, that's about 33% of the budget, so we're right on track there. Um, on the expense side, we've expended 6.6 .6 million, that's 29% of the budget. Four million of that is our payments to the Dallas Water Utilities and to the Trin Trinity River Authority. And again, just showing you a table view, And then the fund balance for the utility fund. So we are trending ahead than what we had projected at this point in the year. And some other fund highlights, again, um, the debt service fund, that's what the fund that we pay the uh, annual debt out of. So we've made our, our payment uh, principal and interest in the month of February. That was $1.1 million. On the hotel motel tax fund, we are at 56% of the budget. 422000 of that is grants. Um, on economic development, we have spent 239000 in incentives that we've paid year-to-date to, date to um, eight local businesses. And then some capital improvement highlights. Again, Fire Station 1, uh, we've spent $9.3 million spent to date. We still have $1.6 million um, remaining to pay for obligations for um, the contracts that we have for the station. And then Armstrong Park, as we know, will be... Um, Opening up here really soon. We spent 2.6 million, and we only have 411,000 left on that obligation, and we will be done with that project. Any questions? I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Ms. Ote. Any questions? Comments? 
No, seeing none. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. We are now moving to item three on the agenda, which is briefings and presentations. Item 3A is a Swagget briefing. Mr. Keyes. Thank you, Mayor and Council. David Keyes, Assistant to the City Manager. I uh, just wanted to introduce, I know that we've got Mr. John Maxwell. I think Ms. Halley maybe left a little earlier. Um, Mr. Maxwell is here to just kind of give an update on our contract with Swagget. We did attach that to the agenda packet so that you could all see it. Um, we do know that we're coming up, uh, I think, full second year and going into the third year of the contract, which um, at the end of the third year, there are, it starts the one year option renewal. So we did want to also bring them here as, well in advance and as we approach budget season and as council makes decisions on whether we renew that option but we also know that there have been some issues identified um, through most of the contract where there are items that have at times council meetings have gone silent or not played correctly i know as recently as february we had a couple of meetings where we had difficulties with the meeting starting out properly and catching up and then with some names that were not properly identified uh, as the council has shown uh, on the video um, I, I can say at least on behalf of staff that up until February 21st some of that may have fallen on us and not getting the actual dais and names of the dais uh, to swag it properly uh, but since February 21st they have had those names but Mr. Maxwell is here um, I've asked him to give a brief just kind of introduction of himself and swag it and both of us will be happy to answer any questions y'all have welcome Mr. Maxwell thank you well, I'm happy sorry, to be here. Sorry, you're now at the end of the city council meeting. <laughs> the it's quite all right. Uh, yes, uh, Natasha did have to head out early. She had a early flight to catch. Uh, but I'm happy to be here. This is actually my first time presenting any item in front of city council. Um, even under the circumstances, I'm glad to be here. Um, but to identify what the two uh, challenges we had experienced were, uh, which came to my attention in February 21st by email, uh, were voting board which you handled that perfectly uh, throughout the meeting. I was watching our live stream and uh, the timing of when the camera was taken, showing the votes and then taking the wide shot to come back to a new item. Uh, that cadence is perfect. So I would say continue on with that and we can consider that issue solved. When it comes to the issue of graphics, um, last Monday when the invitation came to my inbox to appear before city council, it was to address uh, Ms. Gooden's name not being shown in a lower third graphic uh, for city council meetings. Um, the issue was solved in 30 seconds when I opened up our Avier graphic system and updated the graphic myself. I have no explanation as to why throughout the past almost one year that graphic was not updated. Um, but as I had been observing the meeting uh, today on my phone with the live feed, uh, the graphics, lower third names, and items have been displaying as expected up to my standards. And I would hope that this issue is solved going forward and it's not just because the boss is in town. So uh, I just wanted to address those items immediately. Uh, but to go into my background, um, I've been with Swagget for 12 years. Um, and I started out uh, right out of high school working at a television station. So my background in broadcast uh, spans about 17 years um, and you know I've had the advantage of having some broadcast experience with doing sports which was very active in graphics switching shots and having everything planned out um, you know city council meetings are much more simple um, they are very structured uh, in most cases and uh, this meeting is very structured as well so we have a script to follow that is the agenda and so when it comes to 
you know, showing lower third uh, identifiers for the items as well as names. The names are all present right up here in front of the dais. We can see those on our shots, so we should know who to show. Um, I would say this issue is solved going forward, and uh, if there are any repeats, I have informed the staff that there will be corrective actions uh, up to and including termination of employment. Um, so, if there's any questions as it relates to the issues that have been addressed, I can take those now. Um, otherwise, maybe we can just go into some, uh, uh, you know, background as to where Swagit went from small independent company to where it is now. I don't know if that's necessary, but you know, it's um, it's been a rocky road, I guess, for both of us. You know, as, as Mr. Keys mentioned, did, we've had our issues. Swagit's had their issues. And we are honored that you're here Thank you. and personally take an interest in what we're doing because uh, we, we know that this is serious for us. Uh, I don't know how uh, other municipalities look at it, but in terms of what we do and making sure that our information is, is um, communicated to our citizens is extremely important. And knowing that you are taking a personal interest to make sure it's accurate, no matter whether it's the graphic or whether it's the translation or whether it's the audio, whether it's the video, uh, it's extremely important. In fact, we have taken steps on our side. In fact, before every city council member, someone on staff comes to me and says, Mayor, give the cue. Let tech get ready to go. Sometimes I remember, sometimes I don't. But it, that's how important we know that everything has to be coordinated and in sync so that once we convene and once we get going, that Swagit is actually doing its production, both audio and video. Uh, so I think knowing that your involvement and understanding in terms of the seriousness of the situation, if things are not done to your satisfaction and to your standard, is, is to our great advantage. We appreciate that. Uh, any other comments, inputs from City Council? Um, Ms. Gooden. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight and addressing the issue, taking accountability, and resolving it all in one night. I appreciate that. Um, I do have a question. As far as I haven't watched a live one, I don't think. Real time closed captioning, is that currently? being provided i know it is on recorded ones but is that in real time it is real time uh english and spanish english uh, and all spanish. they would have to do is the cc box closed caption box on the live player uh if they select i believe it's cc1 that'll be english cc3 will be spanish okay thank you mr mcmurnett thank you mayor mr maxwell i want to thank you for being here as as, as well tonight I'm, and being patient as well with this. Uh, can you, we talked about some of the issues, but can you talk about some of the issues that, that Swaggett was having with our meetings? When it comes to the technical aspects, I'm not as well versed. I haven't uh, had as much visibility into the support tickets. Uh, from my side, from my department side, it's more the services in carrying out the switching of the meetings and making sure that the captions are present in the live feed and then posted for on demand after the fact. Um, when it comes to the graphics updates, I know that there should be an election coming up here soon, um, but we are in touch with staff. Uh, so we'll have a new seating chart. And because I'm aware of it, I'm gonna make sure that our broadcast team is going to be updating that uh, where appropriate. Um, uh, you know, as an on, on, on ongoing basis. Uh, but we also keep track of any, uh, you know, we call it the wiki, but it's actually our database full of any broadcast rules that the uh, client will provide to us. So we've been uh, actively updating that as we've been adjusting our cadence of pro uh, producing the meetings and then also um, you know, with, the, with the voting and uh, you know, keeping in regular touch. And I think it would also be beneficial if, and we are doing this with other, other clients, is to set up uh, recurring check-in meetings, uh, quarterly meetings just uh, with staff, just to make sure that everything is up to uh, your standard. Um, but I would imagine that if it, you know, meets my standard, it will meet yours. And, and you sort of answered one of my questions because I was thinking, like, do you dedicate a person to a specific city? Or? It is not dedicated. There's no one 
dedicated director, technical director to any uh, client. Um, so as a technical director is touching the system, it may be their first time, but we also have uh, anywhere from an hour to a half hour uh, of setup where they are getting more familiar with the system, uh, the seating charts, the agenda, uh, prepping their workstations, and ensuring that audio and video will play as appropriate. How, how many cities do you do? You, uh, it's uh, hundreds. Or, or, or I guess throughout Texas or maybe even DFW. We have a, I'm not sure of the exact number. Uh, it's, it's actually expanding. Um, but the majority of the Metroplex we are covering uh, from either a live streaming uh, we, well, where we will not direct the meetings, it's just live streamed and then posted on demand for uh, viewing later. Um, but there are anywhere from a couple of dozen, uh, we call it Cosmos or Hoover meetings, um, where we are actually controlling the system ourselves. Uh, throughout Texas, Texas is one of our largest uh, regions for the service and has been for, I would say, the majority of the existence of the organization. Thank you. I appreciate it. You know, uh, the, the thought just came to mind is in terms of what you just said, in terms of the cities that you're serving, my technical brain goes now to bandwidth. So knowing how many of these are being done simultaneously, your bandwidth and your infrastructure has to accommodate all that input. My question goes to us in terms of a city do we have the IT infrastructure and bandwidth enough to support whatever's happening here, or do we need to look internally to increasing something to do with our bandwidth? Are, you, are we okay, or, or we need to be just a little bit better in what we've got in terms of bandwidth consumption? I don't believe any of the recent uh, issues were related to bandwidth, um, so I would say that you have the appropriate uh, allotment of bandwidth for us to be able to control the system. Uh, and react in a timely manner to what we observe in our feed. Uh, I will actually branch off of that note because it is important. This is why you have some delay in seeing the votes. There it goes. Uh, it's it's mm -hmm. those delays and hiccups that occur sometimes. But that yeah. is actually standard. Our uh, technical directors are used to that delay. Uh, whatever is happening right now, our technical director will see several seconds later, anywhere from uh, three to ten seconds later. It really just depends on uh, how many simultaneous live feeds are occurring at one time. However, uh, they are reacting to what they see at that time. And then when they press an action on the Avier system, it'll take just a couple of seconds for that to report in the live feed. Um, so we're trained to handle that. It's not immediate like you would see when directing present in the room. Um, but we can anticipate based off of the, uh, the inflection of someone's voice in which they're going to move on to a new item. Uh, we can prepare whichever cameras we need to to uh, show what is appropriate. Um, but then you, might, you may also see some delays when a new member begins to speak. Uh, the technical director does have to search for that new speaker, so there might be a couple of seconds delay before that shot is taken. Um, that's just how it has always been uh, when we are directing remotely. I understand that imposed delays to solves a lot of problems. Does buffering ever occur? And that goes back to the the, the, the question about our our bandwidth. Does buffering ever occur? Or you know, like a citizen sits there and watches the screen and it just says, hold on, I'm going to figure this out before something happens. Are we incurring that or not? In most cases, that's going to be on the end user. Uh, we do not. It does happen. It is statistically rare. We don't see regular occurrences of any buffering of our feeds, of the okay. live feeds. Um, okay. So, I, you know, if that is observed, our support team will do a refresh of the feed. Okay. So the positive takeaway is that both you and we are okay in bed with Mr. Finch. You had a comment? Yeah, if I could just follow up on that for a quick second, Mayor, thank you. I think it's a fantastic question. Um, Mr. Keyes um, is consistently working with staff uh, there's another company, I can't remember what you said the name of it was, that 
digital resources. And so we're having a lot of those conversations. I think I've shared with council before every single Monday morning at 830, we have a city administration meeting talking about different things. These are some of the types of things, making sure that we're prepared, making sure for different things. I'll share with you another example. Um, we just recently had a conversation about the new EOC center at station 271 in a worst case scenario, if we need to have a council meeting from there and the ability to broadcast. So some of those are some of the technical things that we're doing behind the scenes that sometimes we don't get to have that conversation with you. Good. Okay. Thank you. Anything else from council? All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank your you. time and appreciate the agreement that we have between our cities and working together. Thank appreciate you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is item 3B. It's an official, official sister city recognition. And that is as my particular item. I asked for it to be on the agenda. And what we have found out in going back through history, the informal, the, let's put it this way, the agreement that we have or the relationship that we have with a city in Italy, Monasterolo di Civigliano, is informal. We all thought maybe it was formal. It is not. And the reason I, the way I found that out was I went to sistercitiesinternational.org and I got a hold of their official listing of sister cities that have been registered with them. And neither we nor Monasterolo di Sigliano has been registered with sister cities. I think it's important for this city to officially recognize the sister city relationship. And it's not a difficult one to do. Reading through the organizational processes and what Sister Cities uh, International requires, it's just a documentation of the senior elected official from each city to sign a document in some live format. And so looking at that, I sent an email to the mayor of Monasterolo di Svigliano, uh, Giorgio Alberoni, who my, I am familiar with because when they visited here, I think it was 2019, he stayed with us in our home. So we got to be good professional friends. And I sent the email to, uh, to the mayor, uh, Ab Baroni, and I said, you know, I think it's a good idea if we make this thing official. Let me go back in history in terms of why we look at this. When I first became a mayor, I found out that we had a, a, a actual commission. It was a sister city commission. The secretary of that commission, the person who had to sit there and taking notes for that commission and producing minutes for that commission was the city manager. I was astounded by that, that the city manager is in, being imposed upon to take the minutes as a secretary for a commission. That is a waste of that city manager's time. And I looked at it and said, you know, where is this thing going? So I looked back in the history again and found out that many of the people that participate in the international visits, they come here, we go there. In fact, in June of last year, a large contingent of citizens went to Italy. Council Member Cherry Brown was part of that. Uh, my wife was part of that. But many people that went on that trip were not citizens of Duncanville. And the reason for that is that there's this relationship that is so broad and so great and so wonderful that people that used to live in this city are still connected to Monasterio di Svigliano. They still want to go, they still want to participate in this. And we can really give great recognition to both ourselves and to Monasterio di Svigliano by making this a formal recognition. It's easy to do. So, in this letter I sent to, to Giorgio Alberoni, uh, it was an email that I sent on March the 20th, and I, I CC'd our city manager, in fact, I CC'd everybody in that staff, uh, Mr. Keyes and so fine and Mr. Brown. And I said, you know, things are doing well. How about we go ahead and make this a formal agreement? And I included in my email to, to Mayor Alberoni the, the link to sistercitiesinternational.org and said, how about looking at this? And I waited for a response. And I got it in a, in a, and it was a text message. Uh, and Mayor Alberoni has told me that he's going to be sending a response in an official email. But I want to read to you the text message that he sent to me because it's quite important in terms of what is going to be happening in the future. And I have shared this uh, with the city staff, so this is no surprise to them in terms of something that's going to be set up in the future. We can't do anything today. 
but I wanted to read to you uh, Mayor Alberoni's response. He says, I received your letter and I agree with you that registering on Sister Cities, Sister Cities International would be good. Unfortunately, I am up for re-election at the beginning of June and we are not allowed to make this kind of act 40 days before the election. Basically, from the middle of April, we can only oversee the town without making impactful decision. Since it seems that we will not have time to complete the, the produce, his words, before that, I have to ask you to postpone the registration for the summer. If I will be reelected, I am very open to the idea. If not, I will explain the matter to the man that is running against me. In the next few days, I will have my office send you an official reply as well. We have not received that official reply. So what is his situation and my situation create? It creates a bubble. It creates a gap in time. So as much as I would have liked to complete this and execute a formal recognition of relationship between the city of Duncanville and Monastrola di Sfigliano, we can't do it. So what I am asking for just an understanding what passing to uh, Mr. Finch and staff is that put this in, the, you know, when, when Mr. Mayor Elberoni responds at some point, I won't be around to receive that email. So I'm going to have to go back to Mayor Elberoni and say, here's my situation, because I didn't tell him that I wasn't running for re-election. So he now will understand the entire situation, that when he responds, please send it to Mr. Finch or city manager, and therefore then there will be consideration by you folks to determine how to make this a formal recognition. It's really, really important, I believe, and for the betterment of our city. You know, in some of the gateway uh, pieces of construction that we have in our city, there's actually, it says, Sister City Monastero di Civiliano. Yes, it is a sister city in informal relationship only. In the briefing room, if you look on the wall, there is a document going back into the 90s where the mayors of the two cities signed. I asked Sister City International if that is valid. They said, no, we will not accept that because it was not presented to Sister Cities International in terms of presenting it and understanding it as a formal relationship. So it's, it's key, and here's the most important thing I want to emphasize and request of, of city manager and staff. It is, it is a request. Please do not create a commission or a board when this is done because it creates multitude of problems. You have to have a secretary. We've got to have the quorum. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. There is a way to just make this a formal relationship without establishing a commission that is going to be bound by Texas law in terms of have a meeting in this state. It's just going to foul things up, and I believe that the creativity and the inventiveness and the ingenuity and imagination of our city staff can pull this off without making a commission. And that's my hope that this will be able to happen. And that's what I wanted to brief this council to understand this highly it is highly likely this will be coming up in the future for your understanding and for your I hope concurrence and I wish I could be around to, to see it happen um, and informally I will be around and I may make you know they are now looking at a trip here in what 2025 so that looks to be this relationship will continue and it, it's just, it's a lovely relationship. I mean, it, Council Member Chair Brown can, can attest to, to what happens. It's, it's educational, it's cultural, it's an understanding, and it's economical as well in terms of what their businesses are, what they do, and how we can benefit them, how they can benefit us in a formal, formal relationship in doing so. So that's, that's my item, uh, Council and, and City Manager. And, and hopes that to see this come to fruition uh, in my absence, but uh, still watching and hoping if any way I can help in my communication with Mayor Alberoni in an informal uh, manner, I would be happy to do that. Thank you. Any questions anybody might have of me? Okay. No, I, I was gonna, just a comment. I, yes. I agree with everything you said. It, it was an awesome experience, and I would like to see it continue years after. I'm not even on this earth. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 
The next item on the agenda is item 3C, presentation of the, oh, wait, wait, we had that one. Uh, that's, that, was count, that was Commissioner uh, John Wiley Price. Item 3D, council briefing on the increase of lateral police officer bonus pay. Chief Stogner. Thank you. Good evening. I will try to be as brief as I can. Um, one of the jobs that I feel <clears throat> is necessary for me is try to resolve our current vacancies that we have in the police department. And right now we're looking at 10. <clears throat> and that's pretty significant considering uh, how many officers we have in total in the police department. Now, having said that, we have administered a test recently. Um, and there are three potentially in the hiring tunnel or however you want to put it to eventually get hired um, so that would drop us to seven however um, the issue with that is they are non-certified so for them to become effective staffing we're looking about eight months if not longer uh, for them to go through the academy field training and service training things of that nature um, in addition to that in fact, let me do this. In addition to that, uh, we have obviously times for to conduct the background investigations. Um, our current, with these three employees potentially getting hired, our applicants potentially getting hired, the next available academy is in until July. So that's three additional months that we're waiting for these people to come on. So it's a significant time frame for us to start getting effective staffing coming in. So one of the things I began, began looking at is what's the easiest way that we can start recruiting lateral officers, certified officers, which means they have already been through the police academy and they're certified through the state to be a peace officer here. And one of the things I looked at is increasing our lateral bonus. So I'll give you guys a little bit of, of a timeline. So as you see here, the non-certified, now again, this is the people that we need to send the in, to the academy the academy is 22 weeks long which is roughly five and a half months and then once they graduate the academy they then come into our in-service academy that's where they go over our policies regulations things of that nature and that lasts about four weeks from that point they then move into our field training and that deals more with the application of law responding to calls learning how to speak to people so as I put here, it takes nearly 11 months for a recruit to become effective staffing, uh, which ultimately means that they're working independently. And that doesn't include, it's about four to six weeks uh, on a background. And a lot of that is conducive to waiting for people to call you back, references, jobs, things of that nature. And it's about four to six weeks. So as you put this in, you see how long it's gonna take for us to fill these vacancies. In addition, when we have these vacancies and we're waiting this 11 months, what happens then if, if another officer leaves, now we're a year and a half behind trying to get to fill that position effectively, if that makes sense. So for a certified officer timeline, you're looking about five months roughly, and it's dependent. Um, so obviously they'll come in, start our in-service program, um, where a lot of the time is going to be is waiting on their body armor to come in because we obviously supply them with body armor. I mean, that's normally about six weeks before they can start uh, field training. Now, field training, depending on their level of knowledge and level of competency, we can reduce that to where it's not a standard 17 weeks. And that's done uh, by the field training officer getting with our field training coordinator and then us having a meeting to, determ to determine the best course of action. Um, and there has been times where we have cut training significantly shorter based on the person's activity out there on the street. So when you're, when you're, when you're looking at this, it's five and a half months rather than 11 months. So it makes it a little easier to um, start effectively um, counting towards our, our vacancies. Um, so just to give you guys an idea, uh, with the 10 vacancies, our patrol division is paramount when it comes to any other staffing. Because when you call for police, obviously you are requesting a police officer and we wanna make sure that we have them available 
to go. So right now we currently have vacancies in our criminal investigations division, narcotics, obviously our park ranger, and traffic. So you see a lot of this stuff because sometimes now when we have two detective vacancies, the cases are going to take longer to be investigated because they are being overworked right now, the people that we have in there. So to operate effectively on our shifts, my requirement is seven per shift. That's not counting the supervisors. So at any given time during the day, uh, we have minimum staffing, but I want seven officers on each shift. Ultimately, best case scenarios, we have eight. But we can start moving into these interdepartment vacancies when we have seven. Now, if we lose an officer and we then go to six on that particular shift, I would then have to move whoever was transferred into one of these interdepartment vacancies to fill that seventh void, if that makes sense. Um, so, Cadet uh, Barbosa, she began the academy a couple of months ago. Once she gets out of the academy and through training, you're looking at the end of October before I can ever fill our our six or five vacancies here. Um, so there's a length of time. By allowing us to increase our lateral signing bonus, it puts us now at the peak. Um, and I'll get into more of the minutia on what, I'm, what we are going to end up doing. Uh, now, in addition to that, my goal is also to re-implement some of our programs that we've had um, to provide the services to the community. One of them is our canine unit, and one of them is our deployment unit. Um, the deployment unit is a great unit. It is a very hot spot. Uh, you have some significant issues at this location. Our deployment unit goes, does studies. They figure out the best way to um, address whatever those issues are, preferably collaboratively with the citizens, and then we all come together to find the solutions. Um, in addition to that, Obviously, in FY25, we're dealing with the budget, and one of the things I'm looking at, and I think a lot of this is going to come through with the, the matrix operational analysis, um, is additional supervisory staff. I can do that once we start filling these, these vacancies that we have. So currently, we offer about $3,500 for a lateral bonus. That puts us toward the bottom when it comes to the Metroplex in offering these bonuses. Um, and obviously, once once we hire a lateral officer, they would receive it once they complete field training. Um, the recruit would also sign a two-year contract agreeing if they voluntarily left for another agency, they would pay us back uh, the academy costs. I'm sorry, not the academy costs, uh, but their uniforms, the bonus, things of that nature. Um, and in addition to that, we also have a referral bonus which is if any city employee refers an applicant to the position of a police officer or firefighter, uh, the city employee receives a $1,000 referral bonus. So that's included in there. So what I intend to do is I've, I've completed a significant amount of research uh, for agencies here in the Metroplex, and they range anywhere from $2,500 to $15,000. So what I looked at is recommending the following increase in a step pay plan for our laterals. So less than two years, the lateral officer will get $5,000. Two to less than five years, they get $10,000. And then five plus years, they get $20,000. There is no doubt if we do this, we are leading the charge. Um, as you guys probably understand, recruiting a lateral officer is such a high priority right now. And this allows us to be that pinnacle, to be the, the gold standard. Um, so upon implementing this new plan, um, obviously we would require them to sign a contract as well uh, because that is a significant amount of money. Um, so we extended it from two years to four years. Again, if they voluntarily leave within that four-year time period, not only do they have to pay that back, but they also have to pay back the, um, the uniform costs, things of that nature. So in addition to that, now our greatest asset and our greatest recruiters in our department are our police officers. So what I'm also looking at is incentivizing them to go out and be our recruiters. And if you recruit somebody who does go through the academy, I'm sorry, goes through probation and passes probation, then they get incentivized with the $5,000 uh, referral bonus. 
So I'm sure you guys are wondering, where is this money coming from? And I get it. Um, right now we have 10 vacancies. There's money there for us to use. I met with finance. I met with Mr. Finch. Um, I had some money to play with. So essentially, if we hire six officers, and I say six because I truly believe we're going to hire four off of this list, and there is no peace officer that's signed up or on our list right now. So there is nothing to do with the lateral pay on this. They're all civilians. Um, so if we hired every one of our six vacancies at five plus years, that's $120,000. And if they were all referred by an employee, that's $30,000. Well, I had $150,000 to essentially use, and that's the exact dollar amount. Now, I would love to sit here and say that I'm going to hire six peace officers, and they're all going to be five plus. What it does is it gives us a little bit of a window uh, to allow us to go out and recruit these people now. Um, so any questions on this slide? I know there's a lot of information before I move on to the next one. Yeah, Mr. Kuntz. Thank you, Mayor. So the, these bonuses, would, would they be spread out over so time, or would, they, it would be just a lump sum? So we looked at that, and what we came up with, regardless of where it's at, um, as soon as they're done with their, pro, not their probation, but field training, they would get the entire lump sum. Oh, well, there you go. Nick. So that, that lump sum goes into their taxes in one huge lump, too. That is correct. Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay. Um, how successful are other cities using this? this I mean, it's, it's like a you're baiting other I'm wrong work. We're trying to find certified police officers to come to us with money. Are these programs successful in the other cities that are anywhere from five to twenty thousand dollars making this kind of a bonus? A is, it really a, is it really effective or are we throwing good money at bad? I have zero doubt that this is going to be effective. Now, whether we hire one or ten or six, I'm not sure. I will tell you this. We have lost about 14 officers to another agency because of pay. So pay is a significant factor when it comes to this. And bonuses is, is always great. Um, so, yes, I do believe that this is our best chance of reducing our numbers, our vacancies, and getting people on the street the quickest possible. Well, you know, the base salary or the salary structure is another issue that we have to be addressed. Uh, and knowing that this is just the bonus piece of it, but knowing that, I mean, we wrestle with how much can we pay our first responders. We want to pay much, much more. The budget is a constraint. So I think in, in tandem and looking at the bonus, it's not said in what, you, in what you've just presented to us, but somewhere there has to be some kind of budget appropriation for increasing that pay as well. And in what it needs to be, we don't, was it 68, 75,000 in order to be competitive just in the, where, our, where we are? And then adding the bonus on top, it's going to be some, some significant budget issues to be constrained. Right, but the, the money's available to us now. Um, for the bonuses. To do this the, bonus, that's correct. Right, and I, I get that, and I, and I think it's a great idea. I was saying in the, in the budgeting process, we also have to continue to look at the, at the salary structure for our city and how much we can afford for our first responders sure. police, you know. Uh, another question, you, I don't know if you meant it or not, but you were very careful to say my uh, hope or your, your guidance or instruction, you said my in terms of having seven per shift. I recollect your predecessor saying that it's six. Okay. So are you, in, it's, it's your desire to increase it to seven? and versus six or is it six today because that's a policy or how does this six to seven so play? minimum staffing is ultimately four so in all seriousness if you look at our city four police officers in this entire city answering calls we answer a, an exorbitant amount of calls and if a major incident happens it shuts the city down especially if all four officers are out there so my responsibility as the police chief is to ensure that if we are encountering a major incident that there's still officers there 
being able to respond to other emergency calls. So my absolute bottom number is seven. Okay. Um, anything additional to that um, is gravy, in my opinion. Okay, good. I just want a clarification. Yes, sir. You, Absolutely. You're very emphatic on the use of the word uh, my. Extremely. So Patrol wanted... is the backbone. And the thing that I don't want to have happen is continuously to overwork these people because then they start looking at other agencies, and that's what I'm trying to avoid. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Cherry Brown. I certainly agree with what you're saying with the bonuses. Unfortunately, we're in that world where it's so competitive, and I'm, you know, my background is healthcare. And I say for the past 10 years or more, it's been their way uh, with offering bonuses to get someone's attention. And where the mayor's concern was with the bonus and the pay. So the goal here now is to get people. And then we look at the uh, increase in the pay to where they don't want to leave. I'm assuming that's where, yeah. So if the money's there. Well, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say if the money's there to be able to utilize for, for the bonuses to attract people. I certainly agree with, with where you're going with that. So, And I will say that it's also happiness. If you're happy and you truly feel that, th I love this department. It's a small department. I know everybody. And I think you develop that and you encourage um, partnership with everybody. Listen, this, this isn't my department. This is everybody in that agency's department. And I truly encourage discourse in meetings, because um, that's how we resolve conflict. Yeah, Mr. Contreras. Thank you. Um, let's say in the last five years, how many of those five-year experienced officers have come on board with the city of Duncanville without this program? That's a good question. I know, um, I don't believe any. Um, now, we've gone to recruiting events um, that are for specific public safety. Um, I went as a sergeant, and actually I was a lieutenant, and I um, recruited a Los Angeles Police Department. He was a sergeant there. He was relocating, um, and we just hit it off. Um, so we would hit, we would certainly recruit um, specific locations for officers, whereas, and obviously our social media would would send out information on, hey, this is what we are providing now. Um, it, obviously, if, if I have the consent, um, but ultimately that's what I'm trying to do is uh, publicize what we're, what we're doing to get the officers to come to us. Because it is, it's a great organization. There's no question about I, it. I think what you described is that it's, it's rare that we get a trained officer. It, it is. You have to specifically recruit for those officers and you have to and that's what I'm saying. It's the officers that are on the street. They speak to Dallas police officers. They speak to other police officers in this area. Um, and they know. They know what's going on. Um, I implore that they go out there and speak the truth about what's going on in this agency. Um, so I'm, I'm very emphatic on, uh, again, my job is to reduce these numbers. And I think this is our best chance of doing it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mac Burnett. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, really to Mr. Contreras's point and, and bringing on, that's exactly what this is designed to do. Uh, I, I, I'm fully supportive. Uh, we, I mean, bottom line is we need officers and, and the demand's there, and I don't know if it's going to get less and, and stuff. So I, I'm applauding this effort. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Finch. Thank you, Mayor Council. Um, Chief Steiner, first of all, congratulations on this and putting this together. Um, it, this was something that uh, I know you worked very hard on, um, and I really wanted him to share this with you, with Council, and we talked about this briefing. Uh, th there's a couple of things I just want to kind of touch base on, just so the Council knows all the hard work that Chief Steiner is doing uh, for our police department. Um, I think the one thing that maybe you didn't touch on that you and I talked about was the cost, I, I just want to make sure council understands, so when we're sending somebody to training, we're paying for them to go to training. We're paying all those costs. So if we're bringing in or we're recruiting somebody less than five years, it's actually a net savings for the city. 
there is no reason not in the world to do this, right? It's if you, if you end up with somebody five years that maybe that's the rarity, but we'll see, right? And, and filling those positions, but I just wanna make sure council understands that. Um, there was a question about the seven per shift, and I know that you and I have talked a little bit about that and everything. The other thing is just keep in mind, council, we have the operational analysis coming from the matrix report. That's gonna clearly make recommendations in terms of the number per shift, and, and that may come back and tell us, based on our needs, that may be eight or 10, I have no idea, but we'll, we'll have that factual information. Um, the, the question about the compensation too, obviously, uh, there was a compensation analysis done last year, I believe it was. It was finished up last year, specifically for public safety. We are planning on bringing back an update to council sometime within the next, I would say, 60 or 90 days. I've been working with Ms. Ote on that. Um, and then the last thing I just want to share, well, I guess two things real quick with council. Number one is uh, Chief Stogner has been working with all of the staff, um, you know, and I know that uh, Council Member Kuntz had done a ride along recently, and I've been sharing with the council some of the needs in the police department in terms of facility. But even today, uh, finally, the new furniture came in for the for the report writing room and some of the um, the different offices. And the police officers were ecstatic. I, I could oh, tell the smiles no on the question. faces, and you know, I can't <laughs> tell you the number of times I got stopped. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. We don't have to use a broken table anymore. And it's that kind of stuff that Chief Steiner has taken a lot of pride in, in working with all the officers and, and the momentum is definitely there. And, and I know that just so you know, Council, that Chief Chase is gonna be the exact same way. We're talking about 4896 shifts for the firefighters. We're planning on moving forward with that. Um, that's another recruitment tool. Maybe this is something we can carry over to fire. We'll talk about that. But the 4896 is something I know that uh, the firefighters have been asking for. And so, um, you know, I'm also having conversations, I would tell you, with other cities all around the Metroplex, other city managers relative to public works, relative to economic development. We have some work to do, I'm going to tell you, in terms of pay. Um, but this is a great step forward. And, and thank you for everything you've done to yes, put this together. Thank you. So. So a question just occurred to me, and I probably covered it, but I'm going to have to ask it again. <clears throat> this is a budget item, but these bonuses, the bonus money is available now. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. So it's not a matter for the next fiscal budget. You can go ahead and use these bonuses tomorrow if you need to. Yes, sir. Okay, so I just want to make sure we understand that. that there's, there's, yeah, it, there's a budget adjustment. There's monies available to do this. And it's not something you have to wait until the next fiscal year for this council to approve. Now, you're going to, do, you're going to be working on a budget for next fiscal year for salaries and so forth. But I just want to make sure we get it. There's no approval necessary. Just the adjustment. In term, well, in terms of what Chief wants to do, I mean, this is a green light. We've heard it. We think it's a great idea. There's a green light. We don't have to approve anything. The money's already there. Thanks for the information. Knock yourself out. Yes, sir. Thank you. And thanks for your creativity, ingenuity as well. You're going to be an accountant someday. <laughs> Our final item is item 3E, briefing on a proposed purchase of a 2024 Ford F450 4x4 brush fighter small brush truck from Daco Fire Equipment in the expenditure amount of $236,789. And new real official interim chief, you're coming to us with more sticker shock, but go right ahead. Correct, sir. The last one we bought was in 2008. Uh, this is a just an upgraded model of that truck. The current truck we have right now uh, has had pump issues. Uh, it's not pumping efficiently. It is overheated. We have tried to... Uh, you know, do some work on that, overhauling the pump and overhauling the motor. Uh, we've created some extra space up top to try and get some airflow to it, and it will not hold up. Uh, so the vehicle uh, has run its course. Uh, it was designed, uh, and when you see brush truck, we're not talking about wildland firefighting large brush trucks or anything like that. This is a four-wheel drive, you know, two-ton truck that is designed to, its main purpose is to carry the large five inch hose, our, our main uh, water supply hose across bridges to some of the houses 
uh, that do not have access uh, by, by the roadway other than the bridge. We will not take our large fire apparatus across those bridges. Uh, but this, the, the, the current vehicle we have, it does have a tough time even when you jump curbs uh, and get out in a, you know, a vacant field areas like that around here. This, uh, our current unit has also been uh, requested at the Balch Springs fire last year uh, and also went to the large grass fire in DeSoto. It had a difficult time maneuvering around those fires in which it's designed to do. Uh, it also runs grass fires out on Interstate 20, and when it does have to go off-road, it has difficulty in doing that. So this particular truck is designed to replace that one. It is built uh, slightly different, uh, same size, but built where it can handle the off-road stuff. And it's currently available? It is currently available. I believe, I want to say eight months, but dealing with vehicles, it may change next month where it's nine months. Or right. 10 months so this is a briefing we're going to be seeing this is a proposed approval action coming up the next city council this will be on the next agenda so right. we want to Got give it. you a briefing okay all right any questions all right that takes us to the end of our agenda in a convoluted fashion uh, but we're there so with the completion of all of our business for city council tonight uh, we are adjourned the time stamp is 10 14 city secretary thank you You also want to have your cell phone with you so that you can keep